Hello, hello everyone, and welcome to this 24 hour live stream. A 24 hour live stream, you will say. Yes, we are streaming 24 hours, and it is about our book that we have written together, Anna, with lots of different authors from all over the world. And the book is called The Most Amazing Marketing Book Ever. But before we start talking, let me show you a video that we prepared especially for this live stream. Maybe you will recognize this person. Here it is. Hello, everyone. I'm Mark Schaefer, and I'd like to welcome you to 24 hours of amazing content about marketing. I am a marketing consultant, a college educator, a keynote speaker, and the author of 10 books. Well, really 11, kind of. Let me tell you what I mean. I'm also the founder of the Rise community. This is a community on Discord dedicated to learning about the future of marketing. And about nine months ago, some people in our community had an idea. We had so many subject matter experts from around the world. Why didn't we try to write a book? Many people in our community dreamed of writing a book, but didn't have the time, the resources, the patience to actually do it, but they could write an outstanding chapter. And so that's what we embarked on to create this book. We invited 35 different authors around the world and they cover everything from traditional marketing like content marketing, billboards and advertising, email marketing, to more futuristic marketing like artificial intelligence. How's that going to impact our world? Web3, NFTs. So it's a wide ranging book. It's a book that was very exciting to bring together. I'm very excited to sponsor this and bring this to you. So settle back, grab some popcorn or whatever your snack of choice is in the part of the world where you're listening today. Relax, you're about to hear some insights, some practical tips, and maybe even have some fun along the way with 35 different subject matter experts, the authors of the most amazing marketing book ever. Again, I'm Mark Schaefer. Welcome to this 24 hour live stream. I'm glad you're here. We're gonna have a lot of fun together. So yeah, that was Mark. I've put his name below the screen. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, it's amazing. It's an amazing marketing book. It's amazing. People, if you are now watching this, be sure to check out the book. I have a QR code for you. This is the one. You can buy already the Kindle book. It's available now. And I think, Anna, it's at a low price right now for people to want to get it. So I would not yeah. hesitate. But if you still want to be convinced, you can listen, watch to our 24 hour show. There will be a lot of authors coming and talking about their chapter. And so Anna, you are the first. And so for people oh. that don't know you, uh, let me check out your introduction. Let me also check out the lower third. There you go. So Anna, your chapter is 33. And as seen on the screen, it's about connecting to emotions through experiential marketing. So guys, Anna Bravington is a co-founder of the marketing strategy agency called Those That Dare. She was featured on the 100 female entrepreneurs to watch list in 2022. And I, I, actually, that's already a great short introduction for you because <laughs> the time flies, Anna. And uh, let's just dive directly in. Tell me, what inspired you to contribute to this book, the most amazing marketing book ever? Do you know, I've always wanted to write a book. And exactly what Mark said in the intro Oh my goodness, I really struggle to have the time to build to create one. And 
So when this idea came up that actually I could do it with all these experts that knew what they were talking about and it was part of a community, the, I love my communities and the RISE community is amazing. And it was so comforting to know that we all had each other's back that we were going to um, be able to share this journey together. It's much less scary than writing a book on your own where you have to just put it out in the world on your own. And I love doing um, talks on stage and I thought, oh, this would be nice to do it in writing that's got a bit of longevity. And it was just such an exciting project. I couldn't wait. <laughs> yeah, I, indeed, it is a project. So we are doing it together. I love that, you know, all these marketeers come up with their different ideas, with their different speciality, with their different subjects. So your subject, we already mentioned experiential marketing. Can you give some, don't tell everything, of course, but give us some takeaways from your chapter? So for me, um, experiential marketing, I wanted to do it because it's a little bit misunderstood. People think experiences mean in-person events uh, and big things, but actually experiences can mean little things where you're just giving people memories to make them think really fondly of you so that when they want your product or service, they're going to think about you first because you're at the top of, uh, you know, the top of their brain. And most purchase decisions come subconsciously. So this is where we're trying to get into with experiences. I'll give an example because I recently spoke at Brighton SEO and there is an example in my chapter, but I want to talk about another one. So I um, I was a speaker at last uh, in April and the experiences that they gave for speakers was so wonderful. They had these WhatsApp groups, helping hands. Um, they did a, a little event in London to help you learn how to speak better. I'm terrible at it most of the time, all ums and ahs. And it was just these small little micro experiences throughout the whole thing. Now, normally you'd think they'd do just experiences to the, the, the customers coming, but actually through doing it with the speakers, we were like, oh my goodness, we love Brighton SEO. We're going to tell everyone about it. And that's what it's about. You know, all of the speakers were their marketing team, were their big advocates. My goodness, we're like photograph ourselves, you know, doing different things throughout the, the training and finishing our slides. And it's because it built this really good emotion uh, with us. That's why I pitched again, because the experience was so good. I wanted to do it all again. And once again, I will be the biggest advocate tweeting and posting about it because it's just such a great um they give this feeling and this is what it's all about is an experience you uh, marketing it's all about that feeling inside i love brighton seo they are amazing and the team there are wonderful and this is any brand can produce that and those apart from the main conference the little experiences were not huge whatsapp group it doesn't really cost anything it's just getting everyone together and talking and just little uh, you know the, at the event they created a speaker room so we could all just chill out and it just every little tiny micro experience made us even fonder about them so that's that's what it's really about my chapter that it's getting that feeling side feeling so the emotional aspect but for me also it's about creating an impact. If you do this, if you create these experiences, if you create these emotions, that's some that can really be impactful for people. Do yeah. you have an, maybe another example of an event that you went to that really created this impact? So for for me, um, I'm going. I've noticed Mark Masters is on here actually, who does the You Are the Media conference. Hi, Mark. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so I've noticed he's checked in. So that's another one where we went to recently. And what I loved about the conference, um, the conference itself was wonderful. But at the end of the conference, Mark does a little um, bit where we get together in groups and we talk about the next steps going forward. And it's just, it feel, you know, it may feel like a small thing, but for us, having time to talk with a group, plan our next steps, and then um, going forward, we set up WhatsApp groups so we keep the experience going. And it, the groups are only sort of 10, 12 people. But that was a lovely experience of um, feeling like, not just that you've been to a conference, that you're part of this community and you've got some actions to take Carol and a lot of places don't include that you have the conference as the experience but not the extra 
little touches that make you feel a bit more included, a bit more emotional about things. And I absolutely love that. I believe Mark did it at the, when he went over to the US as well and he did it at that conference too. And I actually think that part of the experience is the most emotional and really helps you sort of move forward. So I speak about um, you know, that bit and and loving it so much. Uh, and that's one thing that I've been sharing with everyone. Oh, you must go because we do this at the end and and we've got and, and we learn and we, you know, we're carrying on with those relationships afterwards. So it's that lasting impression. And that lasting impression is great, not just from us feeling and wanted to recommend, but also people tend to share on social, don't they? User generated content. So I want to share this experience that I've loved and enjoyed with other people so that others can say, oh, actually, I want to be part of the experience. I want to feel that belonging, which is absolutely wonderful. So it's just these little things that you can do that make, you know, just instead of being a conference, it's a little bit of an extra something or instead of one example I give in um, the book is about Beamer, um, which is a local, uh, sorry, a UK wide um, association for digital people. And theirs is just Zoom calls, just simple Zoom calls monthly. Doesn't really cost anything. They don't even come on them. It's just us all arranging them. And it's so simple. But yeah, I love them and I wait for them every every month. So it's just thinking about how can we turn this? How can we make something personal, really personal and really help people connect? Yeah, I love it. I love the example that you gave about Mark, because indeed I was at CX in Cleveland. And uh, instead of, you know, the conference is finished, mostly people, they just go to their hotel or it's finished and have like this feeling, whoa, everything is gone now. Again, back, you know, to the day to day. But the, the session that Mark did at the end was just like, connecting a bit with each other, even if everyone was tired, <laughs> but just defining a, a, an action that you would take. And because we were in little groups, we were also obliged to do it. You know, I had a call, yeah. <laughs> I think it was yesterday with the others to see, you know, who did what, did you do your action? Did you, didn't you? And this created a more, I would say, impactful experience, of course, for this event. Um, yeah. Are there any misconceptions, uh, people, that about uh, about these events and about you know doing this stuff? If this is really useful to do that, or like adding this extra layer to these events, do, are people do do they think it's worth? Are there misconceptions about that? I think there are. I think that people, the thing with experiences, they don't always have an immediate return on investment, right. and I think a lot of businesses a lot of brands they really struggle with that um you know there's there's a big push you know people like paid marketing because it's money in money out you you put some money in you see what comes out but with the brand building that's that long-term business longevity it's eventually not spending as much money so when I've worked in-house or with clients on brand building initially it feels like it's it's a bit of a an uphill struggle you're trying to build your brand yeah. but eventually that snowball effect happens and you know I worked at previously with a game and we ended up halving our marketing budget because we built the brand the brand stuff up so much and it was so much more impactful the return on investment was really really good you know over we were saving hundreds of thousands of pounds on um, you know over peak period because we were starting to build that brand up so in the long run I know it works I've seen it work but it, I think the problem is, and I've seen John Aspirin's on here because he talks about content and I can't remember how long it is, John, but is it about uh, nine months or something for a return on investment? Um, so, you know, experiences are kind of the same. John talks about content, but experiences about the same. It's all that sort of long-term brand building. You gotta wait sort of a good nine months to feel the effects of it and people sharing. And it has to be consistent as well. Um, you have to just keep plugging at it. If you do one experience and that's it, it's not it's not going to keep leading to others. You've got to keep that continual feeling going. People are a little bit fickle. <laughs> and, <laughs> you, you know, they can forget things quite easily. So it has to be a little bit of a keep plugging at this. This is what we're going to do. But this is for the long term brand. We know in the future marketing will cost us less and we'll get better returns. 
we've just got to keep at it. And what happens with a lot of businesses is they'll start panicking after four weeks, eight weeks. Oh, it's not working. Let's stop it all. And all that work you've done, it was just a waste of time because you've not you've not put the time into it. So that I mean, that's a pitfalls that people can really fall down. Yeah, you need to be also patient to see if it works. That people are not patient these days anymore. They do an event, as you see, they they want to have return on investment, but it's not always measurable. I put a quote here from from Fiona. She said, "Community is everything." Yes, you're also building your community if you're doing it mm -hmm. right, and you don't build a community like that. You know, it takes time to build a meaningful community, uh, or you need to have already your audience and then building that community. And also something that we see in our rice community, Anna, is all these different new technologies that are coming, like AI, like Web3, that I'm, that's actually my thing. Other stuff that is changing in today's landscape, um, how, how is that impacting you? Or how do you, you know, adapt yourself with all these different technologies for the field that you are in? See, I think I'm quite lucky because I'm quite a tech adopter. Um, I, I've got a degree in compro programming and I started life as a pro or a degree in computing. I started life as a programmer. So it's quite um, it sort of leans to me being a bit more tech adopting. And, you know, I've been doing marketing 25, 26 years and it's sort of been in digital that long. So I, I see these panics. And you see them coming, oh my goodness, what's going on? You know, social media was the same, oh my goodness, you know, and, and the next thing and the next thing. And I always find they even themselves out in the end. So I actually really love AI. I've been playing with um, chat GPT because I got the plugins recently. So connecting it to the web and getting it to summarize web pages. I do a lot of research and sometimes it's really useful. And I, I think there's this, this panic that it's going to take everyone's jobs, but you know, we need to give AI credit. It's good, but it's not human level good. And you know, as copy, you know, copywriters that think that AI is going to take their jobs, AI is going to take the jobs from people who are bad copywriters, maybe, yeah. <laughs> and it's going to take the work from people who actually just don't want to pay copywriters the money anyway. You know, that they're, they're never going to be a good client, or they're never going to be a client because they don't they don't really value copywriters so the people that you want as a client as copywriters are people that value it that want to spend the money on it and those people are not going to be adopting ai anytime soon you know as a um, I, I did a bit of pr for a while and um you know i'm a copywriter as well and um it you know i i see what it outputs it's great for the odd spark of ideas but it's not wonder you know it's not the be all and end all and the same like i love the way things like web3 are going as well and it's going to be slow though you know it's not going to change every night because people are slow adopters aren't they you always get the laggards yeah. and there's going to be people like us that are like let's let's get going and um I, you know i'm working uh, recently with a company that does online storage and they've introduced a way of trying to help quite a lot of the population get onto online storage because there's a lot of people even scared of that and that to me is like 12 steps below where AI and all the exciting things are coming so if we're still struggling to get people on there it's still going to be a long time for general uptake which gives us time to learn and understand and see where it fits in our lives there's no panic we've got time let's see how it fits how it works bit of human bit of tech working in harmony rather than at war <laughs> right. Yeah. But you don't have to be an early adopter in every, you know, aspect of marketing or of technology. You just need to see, you know, I love it because that for me it doesn't take much energy to learn it and to uh, and to adapt me and my business mm -hmm. to the things that are happening. It really depends in the field that you are in. But in general, what would you say that are the necessary skills that marketers need to have? Today, okay, we mentioned already an understanding of how to use these AI tools. Maybe there are other skills uh, that you would mention. So other skills from I find that are, people are struggling with at the moment is um, being able to take a step back, a holistic approach at things. I think that um, 
as marketers, sometimes we can get bogged down in the day to day and we can really struggle. So when something new comes along or change happens, whether it's technology or COVID or something that disrupts us, it kind of takes us by surprise because we're not seeing the market. We're not seeing that overview of what's going on in the world. And I think that's where and, and we're finding we're helping people a lot more with that at the moment. Um, and some of it is because I think in marketing, we get stuck in a bit of this is how we've always done it. Right. And there's um, a book that I recommend um, a lot, which is called Rebel Ideas by uh, Matthew Syed. Um, and there's a few others. I listened to a really great podcast this morning that someone Rise at Rise had um, had suggested, which is about making sure you're stepping out of your 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 sort of internal lens and and trying to get information and data from other places so you can see things coming get outside people to have a look in make sure that you're doing your looking at the market and doing lots of research and insight because that way you get a bit bit of holistic uh, view of everything that's going on rather than just being very business centric and day to day it helps a bit better i was quote what um christopher told me john Aspirin said which was uh you can't see the label from inside the jar you know you get stuck yeah in that day to day and you need to bring bring a bit of bit different perspective in a bit of diverse ideas and and really get out of that box because it is easy to slip into this is how we've always done it and churn it out day in and day out and that is yeah it's across everything because you find the businesses that do that things like covid that came along they pivoted quickly um is that a word? Quicker. Uh, quicker. <laughs> and, uh, and, and they managed to sort of, you know, circumvent it a little bit. So that that's about, you know, it's about change and keeping keeping up with change because everything changes constantly. We think it don't do, doesn't, but it's that um frog in the boiling water, isn't it? Where you right. put a frog in boiling water, I it know. jumps out. And then if you heat the pot up slowly it boils to death because, and that's what happens a lot of the time, change happens slowly and we, you know, we see brands boiling to death. I know. But, but another danger then for me is with all these new things going on, that there are, there are so many shiny objects, I would say, oh, this is interesting and this is interesting and this is interesting, it's interesting. To, as you say, take a step back and to, yeah, make choices to say, okay, I want to, this is what I, I'm going to do, to, going to learn, going to implement, of course, have an overview of everything that's really interesting, like we are in the RISE community. For me, actually, that's a place where I can see, learn a lot of things, see things that are moving in the, in the marketing landscape. You mentioned reading, podcasting. Um, you are also in a community. Is that also a place where you learn, Anna? Or, or do you have other sources? Uh, do you, for instance, do you go to conferences or something else to learn for yourself? I do everything. I do oh. everything because I find that you learn different things from different places, you know, conferences. It's about what's on stage, but also connections. I learned when I went to Brighton SEO um, in April, I learned a lot about some of the problems that SEOs are having in their market, which inspired my next talk. Uh, I re I listen to a lot of podcasts. I, um, you know, I watch things. I read. I, I do a little bit of everything. Communities. I'm in a couple of different communities to rise. And John Spearin's Espresso, Mark Masters, You Are the Media. So I feel like everyone's on the calls. <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah. on the on the video, I can see everyone down there. So lots of different ones. Mums in Marketing, which is a different perspective as well, which is about how more about how we're balancing um, our lives as well. And every single one gives me a different perspective in a different way on on marketing as a whole. And I think, you know, I even get for me, I like to get outside opinions. So recently, and I've noticed Christoph said he was on the uh, watching as well. So Christoph from the You Are The Media uh, community, he was my outside the jar person recently. We're re-messaging our site and us, ourselves. And he uh, just gave that outside right asking me questions what am I trying to do where am I trying to go to pull me outside of my brand so I I do put my money where my mouth is you know I suggest to other people to bring us in for outside opinions and I do the same I I li like to make sure I'm getting that 
breadth of of opinions from everywhere and it's, it's just so valuable isn't it i love it that you know having feedback from also from people from different parts of the world which i really like mm-hmm. in the community like we are here on this live stream i'm also looking at the comments that you know we are seeing on social media it's now people from everywhere most of them are in europe or australia but already people from the us are getting awake so they are already watching this so it's it's amazing and uh, it's also amazing that we can do this like this 24 hour um live stream yeah. and that we have so so many connections uh that we can make maybe uh because we still have a, a little bit more time we did an event together too anna really you were uh, you spoke in the metaverse with me <laughs> That yes. was also something impactful. Is there maybe something short that you could tell about that experience? Was how was that for you? Did we create an impact with that? Or how did yeah, how did you experience that? Oh, I did love the metaverse talk. So they're so good. Um it's really interesting because I think there's a preconception that people think the metaverse is going to be impersonal because you're working as avatars. And I found it the opposite. I almost felt like we were all in that sort of room and the gallery together. And even though they were avatars, that human aspect of seeing people moving and chatting, the bit where we all tried to do a group dance together was absolutely hilarious. It was really fun. Just um, it's a different human experience to being in person where no one would probably ever do the butter churn dance, you know, or whatever it's called. (laughs) That the this one um yeah. but our characters you know we were we were doing um all these weird and wonderful dances which it, it's a different experience but it was no less impersonal or human and i found it not too difficult considering i'd never really been in the metaverse before not too difficult to navigate it was a bit quirky but like with anything it was it was fun at the same time. And when we were seeing people like our little avatars standing be- before the, our screens, it felt like everyone was everyone was sort of there talking. So I yeah, I think the experience is different to what you expect. You expect it. These avatars a bit impersonal. You don't know who everyone is. But because we're all chatting and talking and you can see who's speaking, it makes it it's it's it feels really personal. And it does feel strange to say that because you wouldn't think it was but I really urge people to try the metaverse and give it a go um I think there's a few things it could do for accessibility yeah wise that that to make sure a bit more inclusive because you know there was some struggles with being inclusive with everyone but um yeah I really enjoyed it and I, I'm quite a face-to-face person I don't like the telephone I like to be either face-to-face or video call and I still found it easy to communicate because it felt like the people were there it was almost a brain trick I think it's very good so yeah I recommend people try it and maybe brush away those preconceptions that even I had yeah actually we are, the time flies Ian who will be the next speaker he told me Yuri the time will fly it is exactly the case and about the metaverse by the way there, there is another author in our book i have the chapter around web 3 but brian piper has written the chapter around the metaverse and he will also be on this live one of the coming guests in my hosting i would say hosting part thank you so much anna um thank you so much we will see you back in the rice community or maybe another in the metaverse eh, because that's always a good place so people if you are not yet in the rice community or interested in it you can uh, contact us but now we are here for the book so anna i will let you you can leave the room at your ease it was so fun to have you i will let ian in in a minute but first let me show the qr code so for people I will show the book you've got in a minute also. But for people that are watching this and they know, oh, 24 hours, that is really long. Or I want, you know, to get access to the replay of all these sessions. Well, you can scan this QR code. You just register and you will get access. So thanks so much, Anna. And I will go and find Ian in the waiting room.
Hi, Ian. Hey, Yuri. Good to see you. How's it going? It's uh, it's go it's yeah. going well. Thank you so much. Um, you know, you're the second guest, but of course, you're one of the brains behind this live stream that we are setting up. So, as you know, for me, I'm used to do lives with StreamYard, but this is with Restream. And thank you so much to to find out all the possibilities. I think it's it's going well at the moment. Yeah. So, guys, uh, Ian is also an author of the chapter in our book, of course. So Ian, let me find your chapter. So this is the one about the extraordinary power of live streaming. That's your thing. So let me give a short introduction for people that don't know you yet, but maybe they have seen you online already. Um, so guys, Ian, I said, author of chapter 12, and he's the founder of Confident Life sorry, Confident Life Marketing Academy, and he's the host of the Confident Life Podcast. He helps entrepreneurs level up their impact, authority, and profits by using live video confidently. So I, that's, that's for me, I, it, it's really exciting doing stuff like this. You never know what to expect <laughs> um, <laughs> with life. You know, things can go wrong, but before I ask you that one, just because at the moment everything is going well, what what motivated you? I ask the same question to to Anna, but what motivated you to write this chapter for our amazing marketing book? Oh wow! Well, <clears throat> I've always I've always wanted to write a book, but it just seems like a huge amount of work. It seems like. Uh, really scary thing to do and I know know a lot of people who've written a book so the ability of writing this in a, in a in a community it's been an amazing thing and when it comes to live video I mean I've I've been doing live video for a long time probably since 2015 2016 and to begin with I was quite reluctant I you I could be called the reluctant live video guy because I was really nervous I was scared I was trying to be a perfectionist um but over the years, I've learned how to to deal with that, and I've I've, I've learned the technology. Uh, I've written a lot of content on on live video. I've spoken uh, at conferences around the world on it, and so when I had the opportunity to to try and condense all of that knowledge into a chapter, I leapt at the chance uh, because it's just just really exciting to be part of it. I think so. Yeah, that's 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 how it all began. <laughs> And you know what's also for me, I also like to speak. I like to, you know, be on stage and do live streams and record a podcast and so on. But speaking is way easier for me than writing, you know. <laughs> <laughs> for me, at least it took me so much time. How 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 did 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 you had some struggles writing down your thoughts because you are used to speak, yeah. or did that go uh, very, very yeah. well? That's a really good question. Cause if I look back at my career in marketing. The, the, the bits that the kind of content that did really well for me were what were, were, were blog posts. I had like two or three mega blog posts that went kind of viral, really. But the problem with blog posts, it's kind of like what you're saying. It, it, I found it a struggle because it just takes a lot of effort. It took me weeks and weeks and weeks to put the, the details together. And so with live video, although there was that initial fear of getting in front of the camera, the thing I say about live video is you just get on camera, you share your thoughts. Obviously, you plan things like we've done today. We, we've planned what we're, we're talking about. But in like half an hour or an hour of your time, you're creating this content that is instantly accessible. And then you can repurpose it into other content. So I think that's, that's one of the reasons why I, I love live video, despite my initial concerns about it. It just enables me as a recovering perfectionist and a procrastinator, let's uh, be honest about it. It en enabled me to create content quickly and easily. And I think the other thing about live video is, yes, things go wrong, but it is, it's, it is just that fact that allows you to be authentic and allows you to be you and allows people to see you as you are. Um, and to begin with, maybe I didn't like that, but um, that's what we, that's what people want. People want to see the real you. The, I think we're all fed up with uh, people putting on an act. So with live video, you can't really do that very easily, if that makes sense. 
Exactly. You know, when you see pictures on Instagram or whatever, of, you know, they are they edited so much like videos. Yeah. When you show up, people see that it's really you that is speaking, that is human, I think, that is that can resonate. You can also interact with people. Like, for instance, let me have a look at the chat right now. So I see people reacting, you know, here in on uh, on our live. Oh. Oh, I, I'm clicking. I'm clicking too fast for it. <laughs> <laughs> That's you see when things can go wrong. People see that it's really life. So Anna, for instance, uh, has put a comment on social because yeah, that's that's also the thing. Eh? You can go live on different platforms at the same time. So there are a lot of techno, uh, yeah, technology technologies mm -hmm. possibilities. Um, but. Also, people can get a bit nervous when they need to go live because things can go wrong. I said a few times the word confident. So that's what you're helping people with, I guess. Um, are there any tips that you would give people that want to go live, but they are nervous and they still want to be confident uh, on camera? Yeah, well, I think, I think people want to see the real you. Uh, that's the first thing I'll say. I I thought because I'm I'm quite a, I, I would describe myself as an introvert. I I do try and put a lot of energy into my live broadcasts, but I'm not one of these like super exciting people, you know. So I don't feel just because you're maybe a quieter person or more nervous that you're not going to be good in front of the camera. And I think the whole comparison thing is a bit of a killer here. I mean, social media is 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 all about comparison isn't it <laughs> we kind of see we see people yeah. on social media say, oh i'm not as good as them or oh, they're, they're doing really well uh, and so don't try not to go into that thing of comparing yourself with others i'm sure i'm sure you've had the same thing yuri i had it you know it's also yeah. like people hear it english is not my first language so i could also be hesitant you know to go live to do stuff but it takes me some times more time to find the right words but i just do this because on the one side you could say okay yuri we hear your english accent your belgian accent on the other side it stands out because people will remember me oh yeah that's that guy from belgium with his accent so <laughs> yeah. i take yeah. it as an advantage actually as a part of my personal brand so a weakness that's becomes great. something I, to I, stand out I, I love that and i love the fact that you have come to that point to, to that realization that you have to embrace everything that is you and your belgian accent is great it, it makes you stand out and unique um but if there are certain aspects of you that you would describe as flaws i, I certainly would describe your belgian accents as a flaw <laughs> at all yeah. but yeah. but but it may be for example you don't like the sound of your own voice you you, you might not like the way you look you may think that you're, you sound, I don't know, there might be something about it. Well, it's probably those very aspects, those very things that other people love about you. Um, and I found that I, I never used to like the sound of my own voice. Uh, but I've, I've worked out that the people who, my audience, they do, they, they really like my voice. And so you have to get out of your own head. It's not actually about you. It's about your audience and what they like. And uh, don't get self-obsessed uh, about it. Uh, it's easier said than done. You have to go on a journey. So in answer to your question, there were three, there were three uh, challenges that I think people can have when it comes to live video. There's confidence in front of the camera, and that can be like a mindset thing. And that's mm -hmm. probably what we've been focusing on. Then there's the confidence with the tech. Uh, and I know you're, you're you're used to using StreamYard, so you could have said at the beginning of this, "Oh, I can't do it; it's all going to go wrong." <laughs> but you didn't. You you, you had yeah. the confidence to say, "Yes, this is different, but I can do it." And then, so there's that side of things, and then there's the third thing, which is the content and marketing side of things. So that's well, what do, what on earth do I say on a live stream, uh, and how do I market that, and how do I promote that? And so those are the three challenges. Those three bits of confidence, I suppose. But it all comes down to mindset, I think. It's it's what's going on in your head. We all tend to build up these kind of, there's a voice in our head that says, oh, it's all going to go wrong and it's awful and all yeah. this kind of stuff. And that's what we need to deal with. First. I always say, what's the worst thing that can happen, you know, during <laughs> a life? And people see that it's, like we said, it's authentical because 
not so many people, you know, show up online. Not so many people make videos already and then mm. going there and putting, exposing yourself. Not so many people do that. Would you like advise people that want to start with live streaming that do this with other people like we yeah. are doing now or do it alone? It's a lot easier. So it's interesting. Back in 2016, when I first started, uh, when I wrote the article about uh, live video, it was, you had to use a software called OBS Studio back in those days. Right. And bringing in a guest was really hard. You had to jump through lots of hoops. Nowadays, it's really easy. As, as you can see today, you know, just bringing in a guest using StreamYard or Restream or whatever is really easy. And so it makes it more natural. Like Yuri and I are having a conversation. Whereas if it was just Yuri on his own or me on my own, you're kind of talking, it feels like you're talking to yourself. And that that is a little bit more stressful, I think, to begin with. So I would say definitely have a bring a guest on, have a chat with them, or they could even interview you. But before that, I just want to say one thing that's really important. You need to have a good reason for going live. Because right. what is the what's the point? Don't just go live for the sake of it. Have a plan. Know why you're doing it. Uh, and the other thing I would say is practice on other platforms, you know, practice using Instagram stories, or uh, you can even go live on Facebook to yourself. So no one else is going to see it. Just play around with it, test it, uh, have a, and have a play. And then uh, just say you're going to go live and go live. And, and um, if you make any mistakes, that's okay. It's absolutely fine. Everyone everyone has that uh, experience at the beginning so just keep going it is you know if i now listen to my first podcast episodes <laughs> and now <laughs> that i've done more than 100 and i listen now it's it's you, you just learn by practicing by doing it and people then are part of the adventure a part of the you know that makes it interesting i what you said about you know recording yourself i like that too because what you can do is if you're not used to go live you can first try to make videos of yourself and then, you know, you don't even need to post them, but you can see what the video is like. And then if it's good, you post them and then you get some feedback. Also, what you said, you don't need to stay in your own head and see what other people, because other people, you know, they look at you different and you look at yourself. Yeah. You talked about uh, technological evolutions and so on in the tools that we have and the possibilities. Um, there is also AI these days. How is AI impacting uh, your work that you're doing now with, with your with your video yeah. live streams. Well, I I was I was uh, involved with the your your metaverse event, and we had a conversation, didn't we? There about yeah AI. yeah yeah. <laughs> and you really got my brain going with. So I I I'm so excited about AI. I've you know I I think AI is. So I remember when the World Wide Web um, came about, and I remember dabbling with HTML and, and all this kind of stuff. And I was really excited about this new technology then. And I haven't really been excited, so excited about a new technology, apart from live video, as I am with AI. And I think it's, it's we're in this new era, it's gonna change everything. I, I'm, I think it's gonna impact live video in a, in a number of ways. So in a positive way, I think it's gonna help us structuring our show notes. Um, it's going to help with repurposing. So this is one of the things you were uh, doing, which is yeah. to transcribe uh, the audio of your live video, which I, I already did using Descript, a tool called Descript, which is awesome. But then feeding that into a tool like Chat ChatGPT and, and getting it to give you show notes and things like that. So that that is amazing. I also think that AI is actually going to make the authenticity of live video even more important as we get the likes of deep fakes and we're getting uh, people producing video with ai hosts uh not i'm not saying that that's a bad thing necessarily but it's going to mean that i think as human beings we want to connect with authentic other human beings so i think live video is going to become even more important in a world dominated by ai generated content because you can't you can't generate live video you know i can't well i could i could i could maybe get an avatar of me speaking but it, but i think people would want to see the real me more so i'm excited about 
the positives, but I also think that it's going to make live video even more attractive to people. I fully agree with you. Live video is one of the solutions, you know, for the AI, you know, videos, AI production, AI world that you'll be living in, that we really see that it's authentic. I think those are a few keywords, <laughs> authentic and confident, which come back and also, mm -hmm. you know, showing up as yourself, of course. Um, is What do you see as the main challenge for people that want to start the live stream? Is this really the, the mindset stuff or thing or is it a technological thing? I would imagine that most people are just like procrastinating every time. Oh, I will oh, yeah. do it later. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, and something that I don't want to use the, the P word, but you know, the, 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 the thing that we've just come out of that happened in 2020 for the last two years, we've all been in our houses, not yeah. been able to get out. I'm not, I'm not going to get all depressing, but the fact of the matter is we all had to get used to going on Zoom and embracing all of this kind of stuff. And during, during that time, it was the busiest I've ever been because that's when people could not procrastinate any longer. They had to embrace it. They had to embrace live video. Now that we've come out the other end, I think people are, have become perhaps a little bit, um, that they, they're kind of wanting to see the back of Zoom. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think we're going to come back to live video more and more and more because we need it. We need it as a, as a community. This is wonderful. We've got in this 24 hour stream, we've got people, we've got speakers and hosts from all around the world, Australia, the U S Europe, uh, Asia, you know, it's, it's very exciting and we couldn't do this in person very easily. So to do this remotely is amazing, I think. So I I think we just need to get started, embrace it uh, and embrace your mistakes. Be kind to each other as well, uh, because it is it is scary. And it's about the audience. It's about your audience. I didn't go live for a whole month because I was worried about my backdrop not being good okay. enough. It's ridiculous. How ridiculous. I That was me. I was worried about my, because it was at my old house and it was a boring white wall. And I thought, oh, you know, I need, to, I need to upgrade it. And I was thinking about that so much that I didn't go live for a whole month. And my audience were kind of thinking, where's Ian gone? You know, how yeah. stupid is that? So don't do that. Don't be me. Be, <laughs> you know, be smart. <laughs> I think, Ian, if there is like... That's actually how I see it. But for me, the sound is mo mostly the most important if you go live. And, yes. and then if you would, people, you know, they are looking at, okay, I want to go live. What do you advise them that they need to go live? I'm so, I'm so glad you mentioned that because audio is absolutely everything. I'm sure we've all experienced this. You watch uh, a live video or it's you might be part of a Zoom and one of the guests, it sounds like they're in the bath. You know, it's echoey and there's, you know, all this noise in the background and it's just painful. It, it, it just, it's just, so if you want people to stay watching your live video, you need to make sure that your audio is really good quality. Uh, you know, worry about cameras later. Now you don't need to have a fancy microphone like we have. I know you've got, is that, you've got a Shure microphone now, haven't you? Yeah. Um, you don't have to kind of go for a really fancy one like that, but I would recommend going for a dynamic microphone. Uh, I think I think yours is probably dynamic as well. So you have to have it fairly close to you. And the advantage with that is that it just picks up less background noise. Uh, I used to have a Blue Yeti microphone, which is great, uh, but it's a condenser microphone. And the problem with that is it picks up a lot of background noise. So if, you, uh, if you've got stuff happening outside, it's, it's, it's just not, not so good. So something like the, the Samsung QTU, and it's Samsung as in S-A-M-S-O-N. It's um, as in Samsung and Delilah. That microphone is relatively inexpensive. It's a dynamic microphone. It's USB and XLR, so you can plug it into your computer. Um, and that's what I'd recommend first. In terms of a camera, uh, just make do with what you've got to begin with. I'm a big fan of bootstrapping your live video studio over time, mm -hmm. uh, but you could go for a Logitech uh, camera. Some of the Elgato Camlink, uh, not Camlinks, uh, Elgato, what are they called again? I've forgotten the name of them, Cam, cameras. Anyway, the cam face cam. Yeah. It. The Elgato face cams are good. And if you want to get really fancy, you can do what I've got, which is I've got a, a, um, a Sony ZV-E10, 
or for our American friends, the ZVE10. <laughs> uh, so, uh, and then I've plugged that into my computer using a cam link. That's a bit more complicated. Um, but y what I'm saying is, don't let the technology get in the way. Start simple. You don't have to spend a lot of money. Start with a simple microphone like that. And over time, you can build it up. And, that, and that's what I've done. I've just, you know, as I've... As I've made more money, I've thought, oh, I, I want to, I want to buy a bit more technology, <laughs> and I've done it like that. Yeah, that ma also makes it fun, and so you, you know, it's about being consistent. So I started my podcast too, you know, with another microphone and so on. But when I saw I was making so many episodes, it was like a reason, you know, to give myself a gift, <laughs> yeah. doing that and making it even more fun, and and so yeah, you you can start with a good microphone you you made the right uh, remark i also started with the yeti when i did more webinar like yeah you know but when you're doing stuff like this when you're doing podcasts uh i i thought it was time to change uh, the microphone so ian if there was one tip don't say everything of course about your chapter but something that you would like to pick out of ch your chapter a tip or a takeaway that you uh, want to share with uh, with the audience now what would that be Mm, and this is from the chapter. Um, oh, if it's not from the chapter, you just can say what comes now to mind. That is also good yeah, for me. Yeah, no, well, one of the, so this, I was thinking a lot about this, that, you know, obviously the chapter is about live streaming and it's about going broadcasting live, but that isn't for everybody. Not everyone is either going to feel confident and comfortable to go live. And that's fine. You know, there are tips and there's lots of things I could help you with in order to do that. But sometimes you it's it's a great way of creating content to imagine that you are live. So creating content as if you were going live. And I've been doing that recently because I'm having a, a little bit of a sabbatical at the moment as I run up to episode 200 of my podcast. I've actually been going back into the archives and uh, I've found uh, little bits of interviews that I've done, the best bits of uh, interviews. So I've, I've got those. And then I pressed record on my software. I use Ecamm Live. And I'm not actually broadcasting live anywhere, but I'm recording it as, as if I was going live. So I will say, welcome to the show. And, I've, and, and then I'll play the interview and, I'll, and then I'll come back again. And then I'll press stop. And I'm not editing it. It's just as if it were live. And so this gets rid of the procrastination. It helps. It's it helps you get um, the content straight uh, content done straight away. Obviously, you're missing out on the interaction with your live audience, but um, it's a great way of creating that content. And what I actually then do is I then uh, I'd stream that pre-recorded video live. Now, I wouldn't recommend this all the time. But for something like that, it's a good way. So if you're if you're concerned about going live, if you'd rather not do it, then this is a way of of uh, it's a kind of a halfway house, and that's what I've been experimenting with. Um, so something for you to think about. Yes, and actually, what you're saying about I I did actually a mixed approach. So I did my masterclass. I was live streaming it on LinkedIn and different channels, but I prepared also a little demo that I wanted to insert in my life. Mm. So by doing that, I was sure that I would not have technical issues with yes. my demo at the moment of the life, you know, and and also this gives me a point of rest during the live stream yes. so that I could just show <laughs> something. So I think a mixed approach is good so that people really see that it's live, that you then you can show a video and then you yes. show up from questions um, because the interaction for me, Ian, is also a big part of making it live that, that can really... It, um, it is. And 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 I I love that approach. I'm I'm going to be doing that a lot more. So I I'm definitely a big believer in in just the fully live format, like we're doing today. I think that's great. But uh, I've seen quite a few people do the hybrid approach, like you're suggesting. Uh, my friend Steve Dotto does this for his webinar Wednesdays. He 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 turns up live, but then the main segment, the main teaching part, is pre-recorded. And the other advantage with that is that because you're not hosting and speaking you're then able to then go into the chat and answer questions live in um so people can ask questions and you're actually posting that way whereas that's a bit tricky to do while you're actually speaking uh, i don't know about you but i, I can't multitask it's, so it's that's a good way 
It's yeah, it's a bit what I did uh, in the past too is having someone else looking at yes. the chat while I am, you know, presenting something. Is that also something that you would advise for people starting out? Um, so I think if you're starting out, the likelihood is that you're probably it, it, so it's down to how big is your audience, right? If, if you have a big audience and you send it, send that out to your list and say, I'm going live tomorrow. And then you have like 200 people watching you live. I mean, that would be amazing if that was the case. Absolutely get uh, possibly a team of people to moderate. Um, so if you're using software like uh, StreamYard or Restream, they have a, a chat facility where a moderator can go in. Uh, YouTube and, and Facebook and, and all of those has the ability to uh, allow moderators to go in and and keep, keep things up to date. Um, so yeah, I, I would do that. But if you're just starting out, the likelihood is that you're probably not going to have that many people watching you live. Absolutely, you should be pre pre promoting it. This is one of my five P's that I show in, in the chapter. Okay. Hopefully, I'm not giving too much away. But you've got your you've got your planning. You've got your pre promotion. So let people know that you're going to go live. You've got the production, which is what we're doing now. Uh, then you've got the post promotion, and and that is the, the whole thing of. You've gone live. Now you've got your replay audience who are going to watch it. So make sure they know about it. And then finally, repurposing your live video. So absolutely get people to while you're while you're going live to to go in and, and involve get get involved with the, the chat. That could be maybe you have a virtual assistant, maybe you have a team, or maybe you can reward some of your uh, amazing audience with the role of being community manager right or just you know if you're going live for the first time you can also talk about if you are in communities like in the rice community you can just talk to people oh i will go live can you come and support me i saw the first time i went live so many years ago people were just curious to see what is happening you know they just wanted to know and the first time i was one of the first in europe to get linkedin live so the first time i went live everyone was like got this push notification yeah. yuri goes live so they were just <laughs> watching what was going to happen and actually ian if there are not so many people watching your first live that's even for yourself it gives you more time to practice and to be at your it ease does. and so on. It does. And don't don't worry too much about that number on the top left-hand corner because it's either going to be really high and that's going to stress you out or it's going to be low and you think nobody loves you. But remember, um, first of all, if you're going live to LinkedIn, LinkedIn doesn't, if you, it doesn't give that information to Restream and StreamYard. So the number of viewers will not include LinkedIn. And second of all, that does not obviously take into account the replay viewers. And you'll find more, many more people watching the replay than live in most cases. So don't, don't worry, just you're turning up, you're creating content, it's good. Exactly, you know, you're going live, you just, I say to myself, I am creating a video for people, like for a masterclass, I am creating a masterclass, I might as well do it live, you know, and then, I, that this was my mindset and of course i see that people are watching the replay or people watching a piece of the live stream because people are busy of course but uh, the replays are a big i would say a big part of, of uh, watch time Ooh, yes I am here. In, yeah <laughs> you uh, your camera is going it's really going black but actually it's it's uh, the moment that uh, we need to say goodbye to you already you know you said to me the time will fly the time will fly i see already that robbie is in in the waiting room so in it was great to have you we will see you back as a host later today thanks for all the tips and uh yeah See you okay. soon in the rest Thanks, community. Yuri. Take All care. Best. Hi, Robbie. How are you doing? Good morning, Yuri. Doing well. How are yourself? Yeah, it's already, you know. Afternoon in Belgium, yeah, it's, it's one p.m. for good, you, it's a bit afternoon. earlier. <laughs> yeah, it's a little bit early for us. This is like early morning and every, everybody's just getting things going around around the U.S. But um, it's exciting. It's exciting to jump in. And I, I do have to say, like, I'm a little bit intimidated. Like, um, 
coming after somebody with a smooth British accent, like I'm just going to sound a little bit less. less yeah, you are the, the first. You know, the first person with U.S. accent, actually. So that's uh, that, that's good. <laughs> actually, we are. Uh, you know, it's it's enriching. Like people from all over the world with these different accents. I also wanted to uh, show to people that are watching now the replay that are so not watching the replay that are watching the live. If they want to watch the replay afterwards, they can scan this QR code, and then they be, will be sure to be able to do that because there are so many interesting authors, so many interesting subjects that we will be talking about during 24 hours. So be sure to scan, uh, yeah, this QR code to have the replay. And of course, the book, don't forget to buy the book. It's available already. I will show it a couple of times during our life. So Robbie, it's so great to have you, but maybe people don't know you yet. So let me give a short introduction. So guys, Robbie has also written a chapter in the book. That's the reason that you are here, Robbie. So let me show it on the screen. So your chapter is about why the marketing mix matters, right? So uh, who yeah, is the Robbie? Marketing mix matters. And then I think um, had one on email marketing too. So, Oh, yes. Yes, you have a few. You, <laughs> you did a lot like the four P's of marketing. And then you have two chapters actually, uh, Robbie. So chapter two, the four P's of marketing. And then chapter 22, magnificent email marketing, right? Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, enjoy the process and... Yeah, it was a, it was a blast. It was a blast. Everyone is on the tree. But guys, yeah, Robbie, except of the fact that he has written different chapters in the book, he's an educator at the Clemson University. I hope that I pronounce it right with my Belgian accent. You, and he's a you're, founder. You're of, spot on. <laughs> and he's a founder of MKT uh, G Rhythm, where he helps e-commerce businesses unlock hidden revenue potential. So. Amazing, Robbie. You so you you like, I guess, to talk to educate people. So then I'm wondering how did you come up so with the titles of your chapter and why were you so excited to be a part of this journey? Um, so got into the two chapters that I wrote, I think are really fascinating in the two spaces I I kind of play in the most or not play in the most, but the four P's is something that I think I, I'm always fascinated by. I thought it was kind of a dead concept until about a year, a few years ago. I just didn't take it as seriously as a, somebody who's worked most of their career in digital. I just kind of let the four P's go by. I thought it was a dedicated practice, like the price pricing or product like that doesn't even live in marketing anymore. And I actually taught a marketing foundations course a a few years ago and it was the first time teaching that course and it really kind of made me dive into it again and i was like wow i found a lot of like hidden relevance in this topic that i'm really excited about and kind of opened my eyes to some kind of cool concepts within the four p's of marketing because i think it's such a valuable like lens to view marketing from that i don't think everybody un fully understands the in terms of how they relate to marketing or how they understand marketing. If you came up in a digital space, you may not have that, that holistic lens to look at that marketing fr marketing from. So I think it's a really valuable concept to understand and the way it's changed and evolved really forces marketers to kind of go through um, some real like strategic levels of thinking before they can come to a decision on direction or strategy. And yeah, I thought it was a really, it was a time where I was like, okay, I need to eat crow. I've been like bashing on the four piece for a long time. I need to like get on board with this and understand it from a, from a relevant angle now. And I thought it was really, really cool concept. And it was one I enjoyed talking about and kind of writing about. So um, kind of like dissecting what, what's new, what's different and how it's changed and evolved over um, 61 plus years. Right. Yeah. It's, 
interesting what you're saying that those fundamentals are still valid even if you know the marketing landscape is changing so much Anna said that too the first speaker let's take a step back and look at you know what you want to do instead of you know doing all these new shiny things the, the those marketing basics are, are still uh, really important um so are you more like someone who likes to speak or likes to write because for me i said the same thing to ian i like to speak I like to talk, so writing was a bit harder. <laughs> but you are you more like a speaker or a writer? Or what was your experience? Um, I am definitely more speaking. Um, I am getting better. I like writing. The process of writing makes me think and really think, like dive deep into ideas. But I'm definitely speaking. Like I, I teach. Like I always joke. Like I teach. I teach marketing because it's like. To talk about marketing kind of like my love language um i could talk about marketing for days um and like even the process of writing the book like i really like wanted to kind of like talk use concepts i talk about all the time and bring them into a into a space where it's going to be again translatable in a written or listened place um but definitely leaning on the speaking side i i just love talking about the topics um Again, recording the Audible chapters was a little bit of a struggle too because yeah. I'm so used to talking just like <laughs> off know. the cuff yeah. and consistently that reading like word for word was a little bit of a challenge for me. So, um, you know, a lot of patience on everybody's part there. You know what's funny? So for me, because you know, I I, I knew that we were you know we needed to do the audio chapter and reading it and because i was really careful about my pronunciation because english is not my native language i read it like not not too fast just just at my ease and it seemed okay <laughs> okay like okay just because i was not hyped up like i am mostly during my podcast i'm just talking it was like okay this is a book chapter i need to be calm and actually that way it went fine and just uh, like Ian said just before, just, you know, doing it and not asking myself too much, many questions like, should I really be, you know, doing my chapter myself? And uh, and then I talk to other people, yeah, do it yourself, do it yourself. Even for my own book, I have like a coach for my own book. They, they said, do it yourself. So, uh, yeah, that's, uh, and that's also good to be this part of this community where people are motivating each other. Um, how is that impacting you and what you're doing so being a part of a community like rice um does it also help you to you know being on top of the new evolutions in marketing so so it really so in terms of like being part of the rise community it's been a real game changer again i think i consider myself in like pretty close to what like, ideally an expert in marketing and the topics i talk about in marketing but this is one place that kind of like pushes me farther than I normally would, than I can go otherwise. Like you read books, again, reading, keeping up with the same blogs, the same thing as everybody else. This is a community kind of like pushes everybody farther and farther and kind of unearths a lot of topics that we wouldn't necessarily stumble across otherwise. So it's basically a community of people that are like the best experts in the world and they're given topics, curating the best information for a given these given subjects. And then also getting to talk about them and communicate about them and kick around ideas and interrogate ideas around them. Um, so that's been really one really fascinating part that I've really enjoyed. And I think it's been a really kind of a, a gift from that community that everybody's been part of. So I think that's one real, yeah, takeaway as a marketer. It's pushing my comfort zone, pushing my boundaries and helping me stay on the leading edge of anything I'm doing. Um, and again, learning from you and Web3, learning from learning from like like Chad and podcasting. There's so many experts in that in the space. And it's really great to be able to kind of like ingest from the best around. And I've gotten to connect with them and a, a few people in person too. And it's been a blast too. Or right. in the metaverse. So you, you you have a chapter around these four Ps, uh, but those four Ps are of course, also evolving with all these new technologies like Web3, like AI, and so on. How, is, how, the, how are these new technologies impacting your story or the way that you're explaining the four Ps um, yeah, to, to your students? 
So, so digital has changed the four P's in so many ways that it's really kind of, it's pushed them forward in terms of importance and meaning and also made them a lot more, a lot more broad in sense of how they impact a brand. Like, I think we have a better sense of a brand than we did in the sixties when that was introduced. But right now, like the brand side of things really is impacted by the four P's. And also it in ter- incorporates a, a amount of a large portion of business strategy into it too, which I always think is really fascinating because we don't necessarily in terms of like business strategy, we don't necessarily have the same middlemen that were always there. Like businesses, I always think of the example of like Heinz. Heinz Ketchup had a, a direct consumer channel. Like they had their Heinz website that they could sell through within three days at the beginning of the pandemic. That wouldn't have been possible like 20 years ago. They would have taken millions of dollars in year, and years of work. Um, now they can do that in a day and have that available for customers to purchase from them directly. Um, so where the four P's are changing, like that's a big P, like place. Um, that's a big change in, in it because suddenly I don't need that retail channel to sell my product. And I can, again, reach that customer directly, but I also have that direct consumer relationship that I can, again, retain them on a more effective way. So I think that's, Again, just one of the ways where we're seeing this evolution in marketing, but it's also an evolution in business model that really is being driven a lot by marketing because we can understand how we can go to market and how we can evolve our business model and business practices based on what's available. And that's where like, having an understanding of the technology and what's available and what's possible really helps us as marketers to see that from a, better, from a more holistic lens. Right. Yeah. It's exciting. Of course, these two technologies like AI, like Web3, but there are also technologies that have been around a long time, like email marketing and so on. So, yeah. so how yeah, I was email, email marketing is the cockroach of marketing channels. It just will not die. <laughs> and, but it's, it's, it's probably the most effective and ROI positive channels of anybody in marketing. Yeah. So that it's, 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 a technology or a, a tool that stays there. Eh? Uh, email marketing, you know, at a certain moment, everyone was talking about social media. In Europe, we had the GDPR law that, that, that came and people were doing less with email marketing, but still email addresses, it's, you know, data, first party data that you that you can use instead of, you know, the data that is with those social media platforms. Uh, you don't own the data. That's also a problem that Web3 wants to solve. So would you, so... Email marketing, I understand, stays a fundamental piece in your marketing strategy, right? Yes. So I, I started my career working in social and I transitioned. It, I, I worked in social as a director of social for, a, for Clemson University for about five years. Got to do some fun things there and then moved into a director of marketing role. Um, where I was in charge of a, a, like a, just a very large e-commerce business and leading marketing for that business. I was again, trying to get the, all our different marketing channels in alignment. And I started playing, we started playing around with email. Email wasn't a really a big piece of this business before. And I started to realize, Hey, I'm doing the same thing I was doing on social, except I'm not battling an algorithm. And I'm three steps closer to a cash register every time. And I, it felt like cheating because I was engaging, I was earning, earning and maintaining attention and I was earning the credibility and trust of an audience and leveraging content to build relationships with them. And in doing so, like we'd send out an email and make $10,000 and it's again, a really effect, seemed like a very effective way to do our marketing because that really didn't take much time. So I started to recognize emails becoming this unique beast where it isn't really as attractive as as sexy as a lot of new channels are, but it does need to have attention and again, thought put behind it because it's such an impactful piece of your business. And in terms of retaining customers, I always think about, Hey, how do I break my marketing strategy down into like three different buckets? How do I focus on growing new customers? 
growing average order value or growing lifetime value of your customer. If you can double any one of those three, you can double the value of your business. And email really allows us to like exponentially grow number two and number three and number two. And it doesn't come with typically with an acquisition cost. So that retention really comes from email. And I always kind of joke in terms of like how to think about email in terms of other ter- other channels, like kind of like the person your parents wanted you to date in high school. It's like, like stable, reliable, and consistent. Kind of be like a doctor, a, a doctor, an engineer, or a professor, but it's not sexy. <laughs> it's not sexy. It doesn't have a leather jacket or ride a motorcycle, so it doesn't get the attention it may deserve. But if it's going to drive business results, like you need to be focusing more time and attention on it. For me, one of the aspects of email is also that you can personalize it more. Uh, but I had a discussion with uh, marketers from the US in a mastermind that I'm in that like, I like to send you an email that says, hi, Robbie, dear Robbie, and so on, and personalize it really well and try to, to send you the emails that you're really interested in. But then I had a discussion with them and they say, like, no, we don't do this like the dear first name because, uh, yeah, and I often see US marketers don't, not using that is that like a, a cultural difference or is it like a strategical difference i don't know what is your vision about that um it's probably a data difference like the, okay the, the the level of data hygiene they probably have they may not be able to get away with you doing that so the level of personalization and making sure you have a clear clean database so many people that have historical databases will have like um like sender like or like they just basically have like generic names that they'll associate with some of their date some of their contacts at some point in time as people change over from esp to esp they may have like less than clean data um we like we work with clients that have that all the time and having like a default like if this then this um is a really smart way to do that but the more personalization you can add to those the more the better they're going to perform and the more accurate they're going to basically um, adding a layer of personalization just improves the, the performance of those overall. Um, some people feel a little bit like weirded out by it, but if you're a reputable sender and you're a reputable source of information, you are hopefully earning the right to ask for that data. And you have a relationship where they're going to feel seen and heard when they, you use their first name and communicating with them like a person is going to help that message resonate and also going to help them, again, get more value out of it. So that's where earning and maintaining attention is important. And that level of personalization and level of like granularity in terms of what's going to be relevant to them is going to be really important too. Yeah, for me, that's also the most important with my own mailing list. I try to keep it clean to send this to people that really didn't opt in. So the open rate is also really high. So comparing to others that I'm talking to, probably have a bigger list, but less, I would say, engagement or uh, an opening rate that is way less because they are just sending out these emails. For me, it's more like, okay, I want to keep it clean. The challenge some for me is because I have been transitioning from social media marketing to Web3 that I want to stay relevant, of course, for my audience. That's uh, that's uh, something else. But yeah, so the personalization, I agree with you. It, it, it can be a data problem, but also the headline or the subject line is important of your emails. Um, do you have any tips for that? Um. I can't say anything that's going to definitively work for any business. They need, you need to be testing it, test that, test them a ton. I think that's where like the real magic is and not always through campaigns. I'm not a big fan of testing through campaigns, testing your automations. Your automations are like a digital Petri dish for the insights you want, you can gain. And you have all the information you want to gain from that. Be running as many tests as you would like to headlines, body copy, Start with the headline, start with the subjects. You've got to get people to open it to actually take action. And once you've dialed that in, you can extrapolate that information to the rest of your campaigns. What language are they resonating on? How can you kind of understand that and say definitively this is what's working? But if you're not testing, you're not learning, and you need to be experimenting and exploring different things to do all the time. Um, 
we like to, again, even include personalization in the subject line or in the headline sometimes. So that's like a fun way to kind of incorporate different things. Um, but there's lots of, there hasn't seemed to be a ton of innovation in email in the last, like, it, it seems like the innovation has stayed a little more stagnant there. And when you can take the, 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 the medium and kind of like take, view it from a different lens, you can really do some interesting things with it. And like when you can push it farther and make a bigger impact, it's, it, your audience is gonna recognize it and they can tell you're putting effort into it, making it fun and engaging. Um, that's gonna be one thing that kind of improves the performance of what you're doing as a whole. Like we were trying to increase click-through rates on some of our emails and we incorporated some like redacted content so like for lists, we would take away the first, like the, the top two of that list and it makes it exciting. It makes it kind of like it builds a little bit of tension and the click through rate of those was just through the roof because we want people to come back to our site. We want people to take action on our site, but we want people to find value in the content we're sharing, but also want to go deeper into it. So that's where, again, we can find ways to incorporate new strategies or new techniques into email. And that's a fun way to kind of make it work and make it make sense. Yeah, and you're right. It's all about testing, you know, seeing what works because you may think that this is the best title or the best subject line or whatever. Like we did for our book cover. Also, we asked it to different people. What do you think is the best? And then you, you know, you have a bigger audience let them decide i did the same thing with my when i my my company logo what do you like the most i just asked to people it was not a logo that i like the most it was my audience so sometimes it's it just you know test it um ask it and also measure it because if you don't measure it you won't know it so it, it's not like thinking that it will be like that also measuring it and when you talk about innovation and newsletters and email marketing, now we have AI. I think there will be possibilities. I already I was talking to someone at in Cleveland at CEX about an AI newsletter where a, a newsletter could be, you know, adapted, modified, or just being personalized, not only the first name, but all the contents of the newsletter for this person. So how do you see the role of AI uh, playing for e email? But perhaps for the four piece in general? We're going to need a lot more time, Yuri. We're going to need a lot more time. Oh, more time. <laughs> yeah, but, yeah. But people, people can, you know, they, they can, they can, uh, <laughs> we, we don't, it's, it's, it's like a movie, you know, people see a little bit of that and then they know, oh no, we need to buy the book. We need to join the rice community. We need to talk to Robbie. There are so many things. People will be overwhelmed when they are watching these 24 hours. But if there was yeah. one thing that you would say, what would it be? <laughs> we'll, we'll act like this is the redacted content to just like prime, prime excitement and prime, prime anticipation. But in terms of AI incorporating into email, we're going to get a chance to evolve the way we're doing a lot of things and where we see that testing and evolution happening like the, just the baseline layer for what good looks like is going to raise. So where we were, where I, I think there's a lot of ways to, again, automate and make, in, incorporate new things. Like we've had, like, like there's been lots of AI incorporated into email for a little while now. Like depending on the email service provider you're using, you may have like um, expected next purchase date. You may have a lot of automated, automated, like, again, machine learning happening in the background to incorporate into your, like when you're going to trigger an email, when you're going to send, how often, how frequent um, you're going to be sending, you're going to have a lot of that built in. But I think what's really going to improve and continue to improve what AI has been doing is just the level of creativity that people are going to be able to incorporate into their emails because they're not going to be focusing so much on just getting that email over the line if they can focus on just making that email better, they can get to a baseline level and use a tool like the chat GPT um, to improve and kind of like give them a strong baseline layer. They can add that human touch and human elements on top of it to make it really great. And that's what I think is going to continue to be the evolutionary process here where suddenly I have more time to invest in the, the pieces of the email that I can make great because I'm not worrying about all of the, the, the mundane work that, like typically like that's, you could associate like that's the intern work. Like that's the work that an intern may have been doing, doing like the, the heavy lifting of like the research, the like a lot of that structure building. 
where you can add that final layer onto it that makes it really great and synthesize ideas. But that's where the, the AI can incorporate into that process and just make it so much better and kind of liberate a lot more time that you can focus on making it great as opposed to just getting it over the line. Exactly. It can help you. Like for me, you know, if I write a piece of text, because I set in, in the with the other, the other guests, I prefer to talk. As you also said it, I prefer to talk than to write. So if I write stuff and I ask AI, can you just make this a bit more fluent? And then it comes out and I can still adapt it, but then it just makes me win a lot of time. Eh? Now I just launched my newsletter on LinkedIn, which helped me also, you know, I had all this content. I had already made a podcast about this. So through ChatGPT, it helped me to create also this newsletter about it. So being on different challenge, ch channels, I need to say, uh, repurposing and so on, uh, I guess that's also something that's important, right? Yeah, it's, it, it helps you use the whole buffalo in a lot more ways because you can condense a longer form, like, again, a long form podcast into a few bullet points that you can share out in a easy ways and you're not going through that with like a fine tooth comb thinking like oh what are the what are the hooks i'm going to pull from this and i even like went through um like uploaded podcast podcast transcription and then asked what would like the three biggest takeaways be um what is like what would the three biggest takeaways be and i was kind of blown away by the synopsis and the way it was able to like again, distill so much information down into like three clear bullet points. And I was, again, it's a really impactful, powerful tool. And when we start to incorporate it into our workflow and our process, like that's just going to make the work we're doing so much, do so much better. Yeah. So I understand today you have incorporated AI in your workflow already, but so I guess you're also, we are also becoming a bit dependent on AI right or how do you see that <laughs> i mean it's it's it, we're just part it's part of a process though it's part yeah. we're already dependent on google maps yeah. like i couldn't get around anywhere if it wasn't for google maps like i'm i, I haven't i haven't read a map in years i'm not gonna again that's a part of my brain i've outsourced this is another part of our brain we're probably gonna outsource and we have a higher we have more access to better parts of our brain for the more, more important work yeah that's right, because, you know, <laughs> and more, more time, I would say, to do creative work or to think about stuff that perhaps AI is less good at, like, uh, and then the, the things that's really operational or just stuff that needs to be done that you count on AI. I use AI also for my podcast transcripts, but then the time that it's not available, like the same thing that when the internet is not available or your mobile phone is that, you know, but actually that's, you know, Evolution comes, of course, also with the price. There are also some uh, some negative things. But I, I, I just think, say, I just think of that scene from Zoolander. Everybody's like banging on the computer. It's like, what do you mean it's in the computer and just like banging yeah. on it and trying to get it out? <laughs> no, um, yeah, 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 yeah. Well, another exciting thing, and and I will talk to my next guest who is already in the waiting room. He will be talking about the metaverse, which is also one of the things the four Ps and so on, marketing will also be needed or there are also some rules that need to be adapted to the metaverse because if you want to use marketing in the metaverse, uh, I guess um, the marketing fundamentals also stay there. Well, yeah. Robbie, um, great to have you. So say again, the, the two chapters that you have written, um, what were they about for people now listening, watching? So... Um... Chapter number two, um, why the marketing makes matters on the four P, basically on the four P's of marketing. And then chapter 22 on email marketing. So magnificent email marketing. Voila, with the French word. So you see, guys, you see it on the screen, the QR code. If you want to buy the book, it's available right now at a discounted price. You will have two chapters for the price of one from Robbie, but there will also be chapters from different authors from all over the world. <laughs> Thanks, Robbie. Thanks so much for sharing your thoughts. I said, you know, there is so, there are so many other things to talk about, but then people need to find us on the socials or in the yeah. Rise community or just by. Yeah, yeah. Come, come, into, come into Rise and learn yourself. This is, where, this is where these real conversations, great conversations are happening. But Yuri, thank you so much for this. 
And thank, thank you, you so much, for putting this together. This was a treat. Enjoy the rest of your day. Take care. Bye. Okay. Bye bye. And there we have our next guest. So Brian, let me change a bit before I introduce you um, the QR code. Because people, you know, you're already the fourth guest. There have been already so many value bombs that people have dropped. And I guess people are overwhelmed and they have not read the book yet. So guys, you have seen the book QR code already a few times. This is the QR code if you want to have access to the replay of these 24 hours. So yeah, you could binge watch it, I would say. You just, you know, with, with some popcorn, like I said, Mark said in the in the intro video. So so many, so many speakers from all over the world, so many value codes. I, I see it here on the screen. I don't know if you see this, Brian. Someone scanned the QR code. So that's really great. So let me take some water. So Brian, I already announced it before I introduce you, but your chapter is around metaverse, of course. So let me find this in the list. Here we go. So guys, if you don't know Brian, maybe you already read uh, a book by Brian, or maybe you already saw him. So he has written the chapter around the metaverse. Marketing in the metaverse is an author, speaker, and consultant. Uh, Brian has been optimizing digital content since 1996. And Brian focuses on data, SEO, content strategy, Web3, and AI. So Brian, yes, you are really looking at all these technological evolutions, so many exciting things that are happening. But you, you also like writing. Eh? So I don't know, this is, you have a, written a chapter in this book. You already have written books. So Actually, what motivated you to write about the metaverse in this book? Well, I think it's important, you know, as we as marketers, it's important for us to understand the mediums where we market. Um, and I think we have definitely seen technology change that over time. I mean, I've, you know, being the age I am and the experiences that I've had, I've gotten to see the whole progression of, you know, the Internet. I've gotten to see advertising go from you know, very broadcast and print focus to now very digital. And I think as we get more into, you know, this Internet of Things, these virtual worlds, I think that's going to be the next big landscape that we're all going to have to start paying attention to for, you know, where we're connecting with our audience, especially, I mean, even now, if you're marketing to Gen Z and millennials, you need to start thinking about these other platforms where they're spending a lot of their time. Right. And metaverse is one of those places. You mentioned the word virtual world. Is that a better way to, to, to talk about it, Brian, to talk about virtual worlds? Or do you feel like the metaverse, people know what it is, but they are just not yet ready for it? Yeah, I mean, I think there are a lot of different definitions and, and interpretations of metaverse. Some people see, you know, metaverses as, um, you know, even Slack, even here in the space where we are, it's a virtual space. So people are like, oh, well, isn't that a metaverse? And, and it is. But I think when we're talking about kind of the classic metaverse and what we're talking about in this chapter is kind of the next iteration. It's this, you know, Matthew Ball uh, de defines it very well in his book, The Metaverse. Um, and it's this massively like scaled and interoperable network of real time. Um, rendered 3D worlds that can be experienced synchronously and persistently by an unlimited number of users, where each people has each person has um, an individual sense of presence and continuity of data. So you're you're able to access people's data that they want to share. So identity data, history data. Uh, objects, experiences, communications, and I think it also includes payments. So that's where kind of now we're getting that crossover between, you know, blockchain and crypto and the metaverse. I think all of these things are going to, you know, start coming together. We're going to use, 
you know, NFTs as our signaling um, uh, tools within the metaverse so that we can share our data that way on this, you know, the interoperable blockchain that can be um, used by everyone and is publicly uh, accessible and verifiable. I think it's going to it's going to, you know, especially as we see all the technologies around this starting to grow and develop. I mean, right now we're we're still very much in the beginning phase of the, the metaverse technology and adoption is very clunky. We're still wearing these big headsets. Yeah. Um, I, think, I think this year we're going to see some advancements in that. I know Apple is working on their, their AR VR glasses where you're going to be able to switch back and forth between augmented reality overlays in the real world. And then you'll be able to switch to fully virtual worlds and I think that's going to cause a lot of crossover between these worlds where now people are going to be able to, you know, wear their avatars by sharing that information. Um, and other people will be able to view those with these augmented glasses. And then you could switch to a fully virtual world where now you're immersed in this entirely new landscape. So I think that's, you know, Technology, so the, the, the computer servers and what we carry around and what is generated and rendered on the server versus what's going to be rendered on our devices is going to shift over the next few years. Um, we're already seeing the computing power, you know, catching up to what we're imagining this space to be. And we're seeing more and more instances and examples of these spaces being created and leveraged by different brands. So I think it's time to start thinking about where we're going to be in the next five or 10 years. Yes, thinking about this and taking action, of course, you know, by exploring the metaverse because it's early for people. So if you want to be ahead of the game and just by knowing those people that were that were first those entrepreneurs that had a website when, you know, the internet came up, those people that were the first on social media, those people that were the first using, you know, their smartphone for their marketing, those people that were you have an early mover advantage. Of course, it's a bit more harder because people around you, they will see what are you doing? Like in my mastermind, there are people talking about how, you know, to do stuff in their metaverse restaurant or in their penthouse in the metaverse. And, I, and my girlfriend, she, she looks at me and says, what are you talking about? Is, are you serious? Oh, my kids, they are just laughing. What are you doing? Even if they are, you know, playing Roblox. So, so it's, there is a kind of, you know, there's disbelief or there's, how how do you what, what do you say to those people? Do you take the effort to try to explain them, to convince them, or because it's it's some people are just like later in the yeah in, in I would say yeah. in, the, in the adoption curve, right? Yeah, absolutely. And I think some people, you know, and we saw, we see the same thing. We saw it with the internet. We saw it with mobile phones. We saw it with social media. There are people who will just refuse to adopt and refuse to try out these new technologies. And those, those are not really the target audience for these technologies. I mean, yeah, my kids are in, you know, Roblox and Fortnite and they think nothing about coming downstairs and throwing on the headset and playing games for a couple hours or talking with their friends while they're in these, you know, gaming environments. And I think gaming, you know, that those are the largest applications right now because it's such an easy transition over. But yeah. I think we're starting to see a lot more brands looking at, well, now we have all these people in this space. What can we do to get them to go somewhere else or try something else or do a new experience or buy something from us or, you know, purchase one of our skins or weapons? Right, yeah. right. I was at a fashion week, you know, in the central land of space. We have already brands that are there like Boss that they just give away stuff or just, you know, or just sell stuff it's it's crazy but it's already happening there and if the audience or the visitors in those metaverses if there are more and more people there the brands become more interesting to be there and if there is less friction if apple comes out with these amazing glasses or whatever then you will see a lot of things happening and also for brands um, do you have maybe some examples or some use cases of brands that are using the metaverse really good for their marketing yeah i mean nike is doing you know an amazing job they're doing all sorts of development in metaverse platforms they're creating these collaborative spaces where you know members of their metaverse can go in and design their own shoes and then based on the popularity of different designs they may eventually start 
producing those that that particular brand type of shoe that design of shoe and then they'll be sharing some of the um you know profits from that with the individual designers and you know those are it's all verified it's all through the blockchain so they know whose uh, designs are for what um so i think yeah nike is definitely really exploring this they're selling virtual clothing that sometimes is selling for more than the real world alternatives i know yeah but those of course are then b2c brands where i think it's logical for b2b maybe people have more like more question marks do you also have examples or use cases for the b2b uh, market yeah i mean even just looking at the way that some businesses are now holding meetings i mean we we're holding meetings with our community in spatial uh you know so it's just looking for opportunities where these different brands different companies um are going to find ways to leverage these environments for you know whatever um business problem they're trying to solve there's a company that's actually creating um virtual simulations of workspaces so that you can go in and try them out and you can have people experiment with these digital workspaces that are designed in the metaverse and walk through their normal routines and see where there are areas of friction so that they can change the design in the physical world before they actually build it. So they'll know if it's too far to go to the restrooms from where the, you know, uh, the, the workspace is, um, they'll know if you if you need to move around these desks or change the way that the you know electric is run because you're not going to have enough ports or outlets. So I think there's different ways that we're starting to look at you know how these virtual spaces can be used from design standpoint, but also for for marketing. Um, there is a uh, an architect. Um, who is selling his designs to businesses so he can build his entire um, structure, his 3D model. He can take that and move that into a uh, metaverse space, and then they can come and look through the building and see if the structure is right. So those are kind of like, um, it's a little easier to see how, those, how we fit into those kind of uses of these virtual spaces. But I think we're going to see more and more what you know what we're really looking at as experience marketing is really being able to pull your user into whatever you know product solution service that you feature and figure out how to integrate that into a full metaverse experience yeah so for instance you we are talking about spatial i have my penthouse on spatial and i see it a bit like a website brian okay you're also into data and so on you're measuring everything but i have uh, like i am thinking that maybe people will spend more time in my penthouse clicking on all every watching like videos looking at stuff than they maybe would do on my website that's something like i wanted to check i want to measure of course uh, i don't know what you think about that and also can we measure things in the metaverse? How would we measure stuff in the metaverse? Yeah, and I think we're going to see more and more uh, data being shared by these platforms. As even the platforms are trying to figure out what metrics are most valuable to, you know, I mean, obviously for like a B2C brand, you, you can measure revenue that you're generating from these yeah. different platforms. So what you're selling on the platform. Those are fairly easy things to measure. But when you start thinking about, you know, time and engagement and how much activity you're getting in your different communities and even down to the point where, you know, you can start measuring how much time people are spending standing in front of one image or interacting with one experience. You know, once we can start measuring things like that, then we're going to have a whole new level of personalized marketing available to us where we can start looking for, you know, other opportunities outside of the environment that we've been operating in, you know, to create those same experiences where now we're going to be able to, you know, serve up, they won't be ads, serve up our experiences, add our experiences to other similar uh, experiences that are going on around the metaverse. So yeah, we're, we're going to see a completely new dynamic on, you know, how we target users, how we can personalize content for users, all based on data that they 
intentionally are sharing with us. So it's not data that we're trying to pull from them. It's data that they feel comfortable saying, yeah, you can use my data around you know, what, what I'm looking at within your environment or where I'm spending time in your environment or what I'm interacting with. Exactly. That's the whole promise, of course, of Web3. Another technology, and I read it during your introduction, is AI. Which role do you see AI playing in the metaverse? Yeah, I mean, so AI is going to be the, the great d data cruncher for the metaverse. I think AI is going to be able to provide, I mean, talk about, you know, online dating. I mean, metaverse dating is going to, is going to go to a whole new level. Um, where AI is going to be able to match people based on, you know, not only whether you're swiping right or left, but how you're engaging in a conversation, in an interaction, how you're rating the, uh, you know, um, engagement with somebody else. And it'll be very, you know, based on that, it will be able to match you with a much broader, much wider variety of, of people who are going to be able to represent themselves in a variety of different ways. So instead of like sitting here, you know, both of us in front of our uh, our monitors and our cameras, we'll, we'll have our headsets on and you'll be able to represent yourself in whatever, you know, physical audio experience that you want to, you know, communicate and people will be able to, they won't be tied to their physical presence as much and they'll be able to be more creative as far as how they represent themselves. And I think it's going to be, I mean, already we know a lot of people who we meet in, you know, these online spaces and then we meet them in person. Just like <laughs> we met in person you know, a few weeks ago. Yeah. Um, and it's always great to see, you know, Oh, this, you look different. You're taller than I thought you're shorter than I thought you're, you know, you're different. <laughs> but I think when we're in these full virtual, you know, avatar situations, it's going to it's going to add a whole new level to that where, you know, people are going to be, well, do I want to share what I really look like or, you know, do I want to share uh, a virtual simulation of myself because I'm going to meet this person eventually. So. Yeah, I, I'm also looking at the chat at the moment, Brian, because a lot of uh, the chat actually it's on social media. We are streaming on different platforms. People are reacting about the value that that we are that we are bringing. I guess that it, there are so many different topics, like metaverse is one that we talked about, others too. Um, yeah, so if there was one of the, I don't know, about your chapter, one of the things that you would like to talk about, not giving everything away, but one of the points that you make in your chapter that you want to mention, what would that be? Yeah, and I think, you know, the, the biggest thing is, I mean, there's a, a lot of tips in the chapter, a lot of things that we're doing in you know, marketing now, we're still going to need to do in marketing in the metaverse for sure. Um, but I think it's going to be how we apply those things. I mean, knowing your audience, we all, you know, no matter what platform you're on or how you communicate with people, you have to know who you're talking to. But then I think, you know, the key is really to just start exploring now, start playing now, go into you know, spatial.io and create a profile and go look around at some of these spaces. You don't need, you know, the VR goggles to start playing in these spaces now. If you have kids, talk to your kids about their metaverse experiences and where they're spending their time and what things that they like, what causes them to, you know, spend real money on digital skins yeah. or, you know, whatever that, there's something that they are getting some value out of that. So once we figure out how to, you know, communicate the value through experiences in this new landscape, I think that's really going to be the key where we can start figuring out better ways to uh, advertise. We're not going to just be, you know, throwing up billboards in the metaverse all around you. It's, it's going to be very different. People aren't going to be engaging with that. You're going to have to figure out ways to, better communicate with your audience in these in these new landscapes so it's very exciting right another thing that sometimes people say that okay when you go to the metaverse there is no one or they they, they feel like they are alone so they need i guess a lot a lot uh, it's important to organize like we do for the rice community organize events where people can go and then they can meet and then they can interact with each other and they can see the real value. 
And the spaceship, of course, shows these spaces where already people are there, this central end shows when they are. So I think it's about that. Going there, experiment and interact with others. And of course, in the beginning, you can just watch, but that's also, I think, part of the journey, just trying to experiment this. Um, if people would like, wanted to start, they're like a marketer, an entrepreneur, and um, they want to start getting to know the metaverse. What do you have a tip for them? Where to go? Which one to try out first? Of what would they need to do if they want to start exploring the metaverse? Yeah, that's that's a great question. And you know, I think the key is just to to read, stay educated, look around, see what other people in your industry, other businesses like yours, other marketers are doing in these spaces. I think just Paying attention and being aware is a great place to start. And then you're going to, through that, you're going to say, oh, well, this is interesting what this group is doing on this platform. Let me go over and check out that platform. I mean, I, I wouldn't have, you know, stumbled across Spatial if there hadn't been people in a community getting together. I was like, oh, well, I got to go check this out because people are actually using this. Um, so, and I think, you know, as the next generation continues to get older and as the technology continues to evolve we're going to see a lot more happening in this space very quickly within the next three years i think there's going to be you know i mean there are there are already big events concerts those sorts of things going on in these spaces so look for opportunities to engage in things that you're already interested in that will take you into these spaces just to get an idea of what it's like. I mean, we're still very early on. I call it, you know, we're still in the modem days. For, <laughs> yeah, I for know. Um, but the, we know that the rate of technology advancement is uh, staggering and we're seeing all of these advances coming along when you're, you know, looking at quantum computing and all the processing power, the, you know, we're making advances very quickly, faster than a lot of people predicted in a lot of these spaces. Um, and I think we're seeing these bigger and bigger tech players getting into these spaces because they know this is going to be like the net, they've got to figure it out now. They've got to go in and start laying the framework and the groundwork so that, you know, when people really start coming into these platforms and adoption really increases, they're going to be able to, you know, leverage their positions and, and monetize. So I think it's important for us as marketers to start thinking about how our products and services could fit into these spaces. How could it fit into a game? How could it fit into, you know, a design environment? How could it fit into an experience that we can help deliver to our customer where then they can stop at any point within the experience and say, yep, okay, I want to purchase this. This has enough value for me. I want to, I want to take part in this. Yeah. Like, for instance, the concept of digital twins, where, you know, people can have both their shoes in the metaverse and in real life. And then they know if they buy stuff, okay, I at least get the shoes. So it's not like something purely virtual. But on the other side, you will have people that just want to have the avatar with nice shoes and then also want real life shoes. So I think that the aspect of digital twins, there is also a lot of uh, opportunity there, won't you yeah. think? Yeah. yeah, absolutely. And I think we're going to see, you know, as this AR, VR, um, these concepts start to mix together and mesh together more closely, I think we're going to see some really interesting applications in, um, you know, in education, in entertainment, in fashion. These are really the places where people are starting to get on and see the value of, of these different uh, environments. And I think once we start moving more and more into these spaces and seeing real positive applications around these different ways to learn where instead of sitting, you know, um, you know, in, in an astronomy class and having the teacher lecture to you, you could be sitting in the middle of the galaxy, uh, you know, with planets zooming in and out and you'd be much more immersive, um, uh, complete experiences. And I think it's just getting that mind shift to start looking for these opportunities and start seeing these possibilities. And you can only do that if you're, if you're exploring. Exactly. It's the mindset, of course. You can look, you know, with a closed mindset and just, you know, be, you know, just following all the rest. Or you can be like most marketers are, I guess, looking at what are the possibilities they want to learn, they want to find out and just just try it and see what are the possibilities. Um, and also by joining a community, 
that can help and just motivating each other and, and learning and doing stuff together in a safe place, I would say, Brian, because some people can just be a bit, you know, scared from who, what is this? How do I get in? What will happen? Like, you know, when you got their first, I would say, computer or their first smartphone or their first, uh, the people are a bit. So uh, I think that helps doing stuff together. And as you mentioned, education also, you know, part of the education could take place like in the metaverse, like people don't need to move. And there are lots of different use cases. Um, I know we had an event in the metaverse the other day and you are, we were talking about those different metaverses and you are mentioning also a metaverse web about education, right? So uh, Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I think, I mean, we're already seeing universities start to partner with these different metaverse platforms. There's already over 100 universities who have digital twins where they're doing virtual classes for students doing virtual research in virtual labs where they can bring uh, you know students from around the world together from different cultures from different backgrounds who have different ideas and different ways they do things they can come communicate and gather and and collaborate in these metaverse spaces but then they could you know in in the real world send research data back and forth or they could share you know access to specialized equipment that only one person in this group may have access to and other people wouldn't ever know that they could you know leverage this uh technology as well without being in these virtual spaces and and creating these opportunities for for collaboration right now the thing that I see also is you have all these different metaverses that are out there. <laughs> Every day I discover a new one, I, and then I need to create a new avatar. And it and, and you can I can buy clothes for this avatar, but then I don't have it. It's not portable to my other avatar, and so on. Um, do you see there? It's a big challenge, of course, for the industry. But do you see there also this evolution in the next two three years that uh, there will be like a more of a I would say integrated metaverse world. Yeah, I think so. I think there's going to be kind of overarching, you know, metaverse experiences, but I think it's still going to come down to these very segmented communities. Now, you know, as any technology grows, there's going to be big advances in some areas as there's a lot of siloing, a lot of different companies trying to figure out and offer up the best option or experience. But, you know, as we've seen, even with, with AI, the open source, um, development often outpaces the development that happens within these bigger corporations, within these big companies, because they tend to think in very siloed, segmented, um, departmentalized terms. Whereas once you open up this technology to the broader public, then they start thinking, uh, you know, much more inclusively in, in a way that's going to, um, you know, create these opportunities for these bigger uh, landscapes. And I think we're, you know, we're seeing a lot of kind of jockeying back and forth with different um, metaverse spaces. But I think once you find uh, one space that kind of ties in the blockchain, um, NFTs, crypto, the best, where you've got the payments, you've got the consumer side, uh, you've got the access. And then once the technology makes it easy for people to get in and out, that's where you're going to start seeing some platforms that are going to expand rapidly. And I think those are going to be the more open source, you know, shared developer uh, focused communities initially. Um, and then people are going to figure out ways to create smaller sub communities within those, within those spaces. Oh. I am showing the, you know, somebody scanned it, the QR code on the screen. So people that just want to listen again, you know, or just don't want to miss anything of the 24 hours, you can scan the QR code, just, just register, and you will have access to the replays. One of the things I was thinking of, Brian, and it is really a good transition to our next guest, which is Chad, is recording my podcast in the metaverse. <laughs> so that is something I've been thinking about, and we can probably discuss this at a later moment uh, because time flies. Brian, it was a pleasure again to have you. You were already on my podcast and now you are on this live stream. I'd love to talk to you. And uh, Great conversation, Yuri, and, and great comments in the, in the chat. I love it. Feel free, anybody to, to reach out to me with any, 
any metaverse discussion ideas. I love, love talking about metaverse, crypto, Web3, AI, so much going on in, in this space right now. Awesome. So thanks, Brian. I will go and find chat in the waiting room and I will see you in the Rise community. Take care. Thank you very much. Have a great day. Hi, Chad. How are you? Hello. Good morning. How's it going? It's going, but you know, you are the fifth guest. I'm still in this. I, I was afraid, will I still have the same energy? But, you know, it's just, it just flowing. All these comments on the chat, um, it's, it's amazing. I was already mentioning you, Chad, uh, because I was talking to Brian about the metaverse. You are obviously heard. already podcasting. But guys, let me first introduce chat to you if you don't know chat he's also of course an author and let me find your chapter you have chapter 10 the power of podcasting i love podcasting too as you know so guys who is chat chat parisman i hope i pronounced your name the right way perfect Okay, he's the principal and founder of Ader Communications, a consultancy focused on helping brands elevate their audio storytelling. Yeah, storytelling, that's something that's really important uh, these days if you want to stay relevant. Writing a book, I guess it's also a bit about storytelling. <laughs> How, you know, Chad, what, what, what was it that motivated you that you found exciting to participate in the book project? Yeah, uh, so thanks. You've been doing an amazing job. I tuned in uh, earlier this morning. I was up. I'm on the, the East Coast here in the U.S. and have been up for a while. Uh, love. Uh, I've tuned into at least a little bit of, of all the sessions so far. And that, I think, really speaks to why I wanted to do this. You know, the, the community that already exists uh, in the Rise Discord, and that is kind of built up uh, around Mark. I've met a ton of amazing folks, and I just figured this was something like so unique, so different, such an opportunity to not only learn from a ton of amazing folks, but you know, maybe to offer uh, the two cents that I have in in a very small area of marketing and and content creation and storytelling that I just knew as soon as it was talked about, I was like, I, I got to participate. If it's not podcast, like I'll, I'll, I'll write any chapter. I'll figure out a way to, <laughs> to be a part of this just for uh, you know, the experience along the way. I mean, it's been incredibly eye opening. I have not written a book. Uh, I am a podcaster and got into podcasting because of how much I actually hate writing. Uh, but this was the perfect uh, way to get into it. You know, it was only one chapter and I ended up uh, collaborating with Marion Abrams, who I'm actually going to be interviewing later today. Uh, and so she's the co-author on the podcasting chapter with me. So even having someone else as brilliant as her kind of available and to bounce ideas off of uh, and work on this, it was, was a fantastic experience. Yeah, that sounds also like a, a special experience to write a chapter with two people so because you uh, need to be aligned of course was it was it did you guys have like the same principles was it enriching to discuss or were you guys aligned from in the beginning uh, it was a How total did... total knockdown fight we had no i'm kidding um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah we were we were surprisingly aligned i mean we basically said hey you know we've got to write these these kind of 10 bullets you know, you go off and write what you think we should do. I'll go off and write mine. Let's see where it makes sense. And, you know, there was already over, you know, from, from the ones that we had, we were like, oh, okay, you're covering this. I'll do that instead. You know, I mean, it was totally, uh, you know, we were, we were pretty much on the, on the same page right from the beginning. Um, you know, we, we both have uh, experience building branded podcasts, working with a lot of companies, uh, we've hosted our own or four other people at times. So I think our experience was so similar and we both had the same kind of point of view of not only where pos podcasting has been, but where we think it's going, 
what the real value of this is, especially for brands, is going to be in the future. That you know, we we just jived from the beginning. It was it was a great experience overall for both of us, at, at least from my point of view. What would you say? You mentioned the term value. So for marketers that don't have a podcast yet, or for brands, what what is what is actually the big value for you in podcasting? Yeah. So you know, the thing that I always say when I'm talking with brands is. I believe that a a podcast is the best content creation engine you can employ at a company or or even you know for for a personal brand because the podcast itself to me is always kind of the tip of the iceberg like yes there is the podcast and there's the piece of it and there's a ton of of great value that you, that you can get out of that and we can talk a little bit more about kind of what I think that is but then you know brands are always looking to fill that content bucket right like mm -hmm. every uh, having been a brand marketer and so the value that you get from you host a 30 minute you know we're doing a 30 minute conversation if we wanted to right the amount of pieces of content we can take from quote cards from highlights from caption videos from individual audio files right turning that into we could probably write three blog posts just from our one conversation here i mean there's nothing that i think offers as much flexibility as a podcast. So for brands that are always looking to create more content, it's like, yes, you can go off and write another article or update another web page, but the the core, one of the biggest values and the core of podcasting that I think is just um, it, it just the value and the return on investment from a podcast is like no other type of content that that I've seen as a brand marketer. Yeah. It's also, of course, what you like to do for me, because if you like to talk, a podcast is logical. Then it's, I started my podcast as an audio podcast because it's easy for me. We just, you know, as you come here on the, on, on the interview and we are just starting to talk. For me, it's, yep. it's natural. Now there is also, you know, YouTube is there. YouTube is a thing. You know, you want, I, I have my podcast also on YouTube, but not all episodes because you need to have the right background and so on. Yep. So what is your, um advice for people for brands do you see it as a youtube first you know is that the YouTube first strategy or do is youtube something that you could add as an option I, i still think of it for most folks and especially for brands i still think of it as an option you know i i i come in it from two minds i don't you know for what we're doing right now i personally do not enjoy just watching two people Yeah. Talk, to, talk to each other right that that's just a personal thing however i can ignore the fact that the amount of content being consumed the number of podcasts that are being consumed right like it is a powerful engine right it's the number two search engine behind google uh, so i you know i continue to be conflicted i continue i also continue to tell especially my brand clients um If we can layer on video in season two and season three, you know, if we wanted to eventually be there. But the thing that I think, you know, the value of podcasting is, especially if you're doing something where you're talking with executives or you're trying to coordinate with folks around the world, right? That's that's the biggest value that I see in a lot of these tools that have popped up, over, especially over the past couple of years, like we're using today. Um, the, you know, it's so much easier to get particularly someone that like, if they don't have to worry about being camera ready and then all of the editing that goes in and the post-production of a video, you know, I'm doing a lot where we're talking to very high profile scientists. We're talking to executives, right? We might only get them for 20 minutes. And so the value of like them not having to worry about where they are, what's behind them, what they look like, yeah. what are they wearing? Like it makes it so much easier to, to generate all that content that I, I, I really need to see like proven value of moving to a, a video first. Now that said, I think video, you know, if we're recording this and we can use a video and it's just a head or we can yeah. turn audio into a video, ton of opportunity there. Um, so, uh, you know, I, but that said, I, I know that there are, there are some brands, but there are mostly content creators out there that are just killing it in the video first space where their YouTube numbers are just, crushing it compared to you know what they're getting in 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 audio only and so you know i think it's it like so many of these things it, it depends you know if there's a real value and there's if there's 
a reason to be on camera, um, then then I say go for it again because the tools have just gotten so much easier to be able to do this as well. Yeah, yeah. For me, it was just like another channel for my show. You know, to be there, to be present there because some people i for me my apple podcast i see its main channel also on my podcast website i don't know if these analytics are really correct but they are coming on the website and they're listening on my blog i integrate my my podcast on my blog and they are listening there too so yeah it's it's a matter of being visible uh on different places um yeah but what the most for me the most important we talk about video and so on but this is the sound isn't it chat so that that sometimes can be an issue if you have a guest and they're using like bluetooth ears and... <laughs> absolutely the you know that's sometimes the hardest is you know for especially for you know if we're not doing it live if we're recording i would always rather i'd rather someone actually speak into their laptop microphone than than airpods um you know the the fidelity just isn't there um you know we obviously have setups i've seen you know different people throughout the day i'm sure you know have various uh qualities you know that's why i like the post-production layer right again the tools that are out there for podcasting these days i, I think there's two things one the tools have gotten so much better that there's very few you know unless someone's outside with wind and birds chirping, you know, which I'm sure <laughs> you've probably had people join your podcast doing the same thing. And you have to say, eh, can you go somewhere uh, else that yeah. you can close the door? But barring that, you the tools available to make audio sound so much better than what you recorded are, are incredible, right? And some of that is AI and some of that is things that have been around for, for a long time. Um, so I think like that's, that's one piece that I think about with uh, with audio and being able to do kind of the post production uh, there. The other thing that I think about is on the flip side, most people are going to listen on their AirPods, right? They're not listening with these cans that we have on our ears. They're not, you yeah. know, banging. so you know, I always say like the audio has to be good enough for for quality, but it's not you know the days of having to get a bunch of people in a room with. $1,200 microphones in front of them are kind of long gone again, for the most part, like, you know, if you're, if your topic is audio fidelity and you're, you're a, an audio engineer and like, that's who you're going after. Sure. You're probably going to want it, but for corporate podcasts, for just you know, the type of stuff that probably you and I are doing, but most people are listening to it, you know, maybe on a Bluetooth speaker, maybe on their laptop speakers, maybe on some AirPods, you know, it's, uh, we just have to worry so much less about like what that quality is these days, um, that it just, it just makes so much, uh, so much more sense. You know, have you seen kind of moving to video? I mean, have you seen the benefits pay off for you? I mean, it's another channel you have to maintain. Yeah. Talk about, for like, yeah. So for me, you know, I had the opportunity to have a trainee, you know, from a university and she asked, you know, to come and I said, okay, I give you a project, which will be creating the YouTube channel out of the podcast, which was really interesting for her too, which was interesting for me. So we were both learning on that, you know, more about YouTube, how to create shorts about that and just creating more content. And so it's more like um, using content that I already have reusing it and sharing it on socials and see, you know, building my personal brand, like I've just launched my newsletter. So my idea yeah. is also to, you know, to put pieces from the YouTube video in the newsletter and just to be like, if you can call that omnipresent, but, you know, try to be a bit everywhere with different pieces of content because you will have people that like to listen, you know, in their car to the Apple podcast, but you maybe you have people that want to just listen to YouTube. So we don't know it. And and at this moment, it seems like I have yeah, a new audience that is finding the podcast. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's the biggest thing is like there's there's there are people that are YouTube only listeners and watchers, and then there are podcast folks. And I think that you just hit it with that last piece, like ex find being able to potentially find a new audience that isn't even, you know, isn't downloading overcast or spotify or you know right. whatever you know on their phone that that they like um that's definitely i think the the biggest value and for someone like you yeah you know if you're building kind of 
this multi-channel approach. It absolutely makes sense. I've also seen some great uses from um, folks that have like private, like uh, like Patreons, yeah, you know, where like, hey, the 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 real key content is behind the paywall, but YouTube is their top of funnel, right? So yeah. like they're pulling out their selects two weeks after they do an interview. And they're like, hey, we just had this amazing video with you know insert celebrity here's a three minute clip of it. You know, now click here to go listen to the rest and subscribe to my, my Patreon, right? Like yeah. for that, I absolutely see, see value. Right. And it's also, you know, for search, it's good that just to be on YouTube and, and, and if people find out, you know, or you can just take a piece of it. And so that people see who you are and then they can listen to the podcast because for me, um, the podcasting was also a way to get in touch with people you know, to talk to people I would never talk to because I, you know, I'm now in the Web3 space in some time. But if you enter a space, people don't know you yet in that space. So thanks to the podcast, thanks to being in communities and so on, I feel you've been able to reach people that are talk to people that I wouldn't be able to talk to. And just like, like I'm talking with you now, 30 minutes, you get to know each other. So networking was for me the main reason to start podcasting. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, I've met, and you know, I think you'll probably second this. Like, the podcasting community in itself is incredibly welcoming. I mean, there's so much. You know, when people always ask me, like, how do I, you? Know, I'm thinking about getting into it. What do I do? And it's like, there's so many great newsletters. There's so many. You know, once you, it's it's a rabbit hole of content. But like, so many people are willing to share their expertise and time and kind of you know, what they've learned, right? And that's everything from like folks that started doing it a year or two ago all the way to, you know, there's people that have been in it for 15, 20, you know, early days of podcasting and they've still got newsletters, they've got YouTube channels, they've got podcasts about podcasting going on. Yeah, you know, and I've, I've just found it such an incredibly welcoming community for the folks that want to kind of put the work in to learn. There's, there's no lack of resources that are out there. Right. And for people hesitating to start their podcast, because of course it's a lot of work and there, you know, you need to first invest time and effort to be better. And, you know, at a certain moment to be able to monetize it or to get some ROI on that. Um, so what are your thoughts on that for made brands? Of course they have their budget, but smaller creators, entrepreneurs, uh, how much patience do they need to have or what are ways that they can, you know, expect to monetize their podcast? Yeah. So I, I, I'll, I'll kind of take that into two things. One, whether you're a brand or a creator, I think you have to have something unique to say that you have some type of expertise in, right? When I talk with brands, it's the same thing. Like, you know, it can't just be like, oh, we're going to have, you know, executives talking to executives about executive thing, right? Like <laughs> yeah. there's a lot of, there's a lot of folks that want to do things like that. And it's like, well, but what's the value? Like, what are you as a, you know, the global president of, you know, toy making, right? Whatever it is. Um, and your company, like, what's the unique perspective that you have? Cause that's the only reason someone's actually going to listen yeah. and pay attention. Right. So like there, there's gotta be some kind of hook. Um, and the same thing with the person, right? Like I, I would never um, deter someone from starting a podcast. I think you know, everything that you've talked about, right? Meeting people, get becoming known. Like there's a ton of, uh, uh, there's a ton of upside for creating that for both brands and creators. But like everything, I, you need to put the work in up front, right? Like you really need to think about, and that's what we talk about in our chapter in the book. Like here's all the questions you should think about and the, the right and those questions are not what microphone do i need to buy what software do i need to use what what headphones right like like that is not the questions you should be thinking about the questions you should be thinking about are what what's what uniqueness do i bring to the table what's the problem that i really want to solve what are we passionate about what do we do that's better than anybody else right if you're i mean i'm working with companies everything from 2 to 3 year old startups to hundred plus year old organizations. Right. And it's like, you know, if you're brand new, why did you start this business? What are you doing different than your competitor? If you're a hundred years old, like you did something right along the way, what are you doing right, right now? That's enabled you to be a hundred year old brand. 
like let's let's uncover that and and talk about that you know is it because you've got access to the world's greatest scientists is it because you have built a network of the you know the best investors that right whatever it happens to be like so there's a lot of questions and i advise everyone to kind of dig in before they even click record on that first episode to really think about how you're going to be different what's unique about you what are these things that you want to do you'll come up with your game plan on the on the kind of monetizing i mean this is a why i love working with brands right because i'm not running pre-roll i'm not like the the brands that i'm working with want to tell the story so i'm talking to like marketing and comms teams right so they want something to go along with a campaign or they want to talk about a specific initiative or right like they're they've got some unique type of access so i'm lucky enough that like and they kind of purposefully i don't really have to worry about that kind of with on the on the branded side right like the content is is the value for them but we do do advertising you know on other podcasts to, to drive it so i know some of that that world more from kind of the buyer perspective i would tell an individual creator you know for right now you should not be getting into podcasting because you think it's going to be a path to making money right yeah. i think there's a lot of other values you know i think every you should be starting you know it should be part of a holistic approach right there's other content that you need to be creating and i think when you get to that level of okay i've got a hundred listener you know i'm getting a hundred downloads per episode and i've got 2500 subscribers to my email and i've got 3000 followers on late right like the the bundle of stuff is kind of what's going to con continue to kind of unlock value for you and growing all of that holistically um i think it also opens a ton of i think um from what i've seen you are likely to make money you're more likely to make money actually from doing something completely different because a brand or someone finds you because of your podcast than actually the sponsorship of your podcast right there someone's gonna hire you to come be a keynote speaker or to come host a uh, a panel somewhere or hey can you host a podcast for me brand you know on top of it um right can you come do a consulting gig for me like that's where at least the folks the folks that i know and I, everyone has a very different experience i think you are more likely to kind of all those ancillary things you know you're that's more likely to generate some revenue than actually like getting a sponsor for your for your podcast uh itself and it's just going to take time to get that done. Indeed, I, you know. I'd love to know what what your experience has been like. No, you know, it's <laughs> like that. You know, I was also at at CX in Cleveland, and uh, and Joe Polizzi was talking about content creators, which including podcasters. It takes time. Sure. You know, it's eighteen months at on average, and it is not from like sponsoring or stuff. It's like indeed consulting, speaking engagement, stuff like that, selling books, stuff that, that can, and building your personal brand. I started podcasting just, I just said, let's try it. You know, I'm not a native English speaker, but just, you know, try and see how it goes. And then it, there was so, it was an interesting evolution and you learn and you get to know people. And it was just because I like to do that. And then I was just thinking, okay, I need to, like you said, create content in one way or another. So I, I make the content that I like to do. Another thing is I also like to try out stuff. So I'm wondering how you see that, like with these new technologies like AI and Web3. There are a few more possibilities. Are you staying with, the, I would say, the traditional way of working with those bigger brands or other clients? Or are you trying out or thinking of trying out, you know, um, AI, or even what, what I'm thinking of, recording a podcast in the metaverse. I'm curious to hear your thoughts about that. Yeah, you know, the metaverse thing is super interesting to me. I wonder, like, can we, would we have a bit, I'd say a better or a different type of conversation if you and I were in spatial and we both had our goggle, you know, if we, if, yeah. I don't know, I don't know if we would, or wouldn't, but I certainly think it, it's worth trying. The AI stuff is super interesting. I mean, I, uh, I'm i working with another group right now, actually in the Web3 space that is actually doing like investor pitching right now. Okay. And, we're, and we're live streaming it. And we had uh, a group the other day 
that it was very clearly uh, it was an avatar, right? They did kind of that loom style, right? The small video in the corner while going through their slides. It was an avatar. It was it was not an actual person. And it was very clearly, I'm assuming they used something like Descript or one of these others where they they wrote the transcript and some voice generated the <laughs> audio file um, for it. And it was a, you know, it was, it, the, the folks are doxxed. It was a team of like three folks. And maybe for whatever reason, similarly, I think not all of them are from the US. Maybe they were worried about their act. I don't know. I, I'd love to actually talk to them and find out why. But I was yeah. like, oh, for the first 30 seconds, I was like, this is weird. And then the longer it went on, I was like, this is actually better than some people's <laughs> presentation. Like, th yeah, this is this is probably kind of middle of the road. Like, it, I thought it was yeah. good enough for where we are. So another year or two from now, if you can actually, like, write that transcript, but then start putting, you know, bolding things for emphasis or – you know, hey, I want my question to be the last five seconds of it, right? Like, if you can start doing things like that that make it a little bit more natural, um, it it's going to be, like, I mean, off the charts of, like, what we're going to be able to do. So, yeah, I mean, I'm playing around with as much of this stuff as I can. Again, you know, the way for me, I, I'd like to look at it, like, I'm working with big brands and a, and a couple of clients, Um that really pay the bills. And then that lets me kind of, you know, go off and kind of do so, you know, I'm working with this web three group. Like I, you know, I, I, I you know, I'm, I'm interested, like I'm interested to see what the Apple thing is going to be, you know, next yeah. month. Right. Like there's so much stuff coming out that for me, the, the hard part ends up being like, I can't, how do I not blow a whole day? Like just playing around with, you know, the, the latest and greatest when I have, you know, uh, a, a bunch of stuff that uh, is due to clients or editing for other projects or things like that. So, uh, you know, I think that's the hard part with uh, is finding that balance with a lot of these new things. I don't know if you're uncovering the same thing. It's like, for you me. lose three hours all of a sudden. <laughs> yeah, it's just, you know, because it's different if you do this for a client or for a brand, you know, you want to get the work done. If it's for yourself, you can say, okay, I will just try it. And and, and so I try to use AI, you know, to, to get better results or make things go faster, not to do the work for me. I want really to, to keep the creative work. As you know, I use the AI to create you know, the podcast articles, the show notes for my podcast and so on. That's that, that huge. Helps. I mean, and that's that all that is like six months old. But I mean, there are there are three companies out there that I'm seeing right now. Um, and it's like every week they're doing releases where like this one does this and this one adds it. And then the, I mean, so, yeah, the the AI kind of the, the ability to summarize and create content from audio like through through ai is insane and that's not it right like when we started writing this book none of those companies existed or if they did they were in like super yeah. beta right like <laughs> so yeah if you were to talk to me today i mean you know the we we could rewrite the next book that's just let's do all the same chapters but let's just talk about the impact that ai is having on every yeah. one of those same topics right like that that we we could do a whole series around that I know. So it would be like, <laughs> when we look back, you know, when we start writing the book and so on, so many things have changed with AI, with like in, in also in the Web3 world and so on. So it's really challenging. Um, so yeah, we can already think of our next oh, book chat. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or making, I know we have also a podcast for our community, which yep. is which you are running with a few others. I also want to take part of it when I can. And this is done on Discord. So there are different places where you can record podcasts, of course, these days. Um, so guys, um, yeah, chat will also be later today. You will yeah. be back as a host, right, chat? Come back in, uh, what is it, uh, seven and a half hours. Uh, oh no, sorry. What do we, uh, I started 6 PM. So nine and a half hours from now. Uh, yeah, I'll be, uh, I'll be hosting a bunch of folks this afternoon. Uh, uh, I'll be talking with, uh, Julia Bramble, Al Boyle, Mary Abrams, uh, Jeff and Fiona Lucas. Um, and yeah, it's going to be, it's going to be great. 
uh, we're talking about, let's see, what are we talking about? We're talking about Twitter. We're talking about uh, impactful messaging. We're going to talk podcasting again with, uh, with Marion. That's going to be super fun. Uh, we're going to talk direct mail, right? So we're spending so much time with like new technology. Let's talk about the value of, of you know, some, some uh, tried and true kind of existing uh, and proven technology. Uh, and then I'm going to end uh, with Fiona talking about the evolution of marketing, which again, I think is like a great summary for so much of the conversations that uh, that we've been having. So thank you for hosting me. Thank you for doing this this first group, man. You you did an amazing job. Um, it's going to be a fantastic day here. It will be. Thank you so much to get your feedback, Chad, to having shared, you know, all these different ideas, thoughts, tips. But people, if you want to listen again, because... <laughs> already there is already so much value that has been dropped you can scan these qr codes you can register and then you will have access to the recordings and i guess it will be 24 hours of amazing content there will be in every chapter something to take away so thanks chat thanks for everyone everyone who has already been listening and be watching are 24 hours it's only the first part so if you guys want to have more please come back i think our next host uh if i saw it correctly will it be ian i'm not sure but we will see there are lots of different hosts you are one so please be back and uh yeah don't forget to scan the qr codes and of course if you haven't bought the book already there is a chance to buy the book at a very low price at this moment. You can see the QR code here. It's a Kindle book. There will be other versions coming out later. But uh, yeah, Chad, must be a pleasure. And I'm looking forward also to see you on the screen as a host of yes. one of the next parts. Amazing. Thank you so much. Thanks for everyone uh, dropping the comments on the on the YouTube as well. We'll, we'll see you in a little bit. Okay, guys. Take care. Bye.